So in the summer of 1994, uh, my partner Jason Rubin and I were wrapping up Way of the Warrior, which was our 3DO fighting game. And we were trying to figure out what kind of game do we want to make next. And it's this interesting synergy when you're figuring out a new game, like what do you think will sell well? What do you think will be fun to make? What do you think you can make? What's the competition going to be like? And we played everything all the time. And we knew we wanted to make a console game. So the biggest genre on consoles at the, at the time were platform action games. Games like Super Mario World, the Donkey Kong Country, which wasn't actually out yet, but uh, we had played at some trade shows and stuff and looked phenomenal. And all sorts of other like classic 16-bit platform games. And at the same time, in the arcades, there was new 3D hardware, and certain genres were making the transition from their traditional, like, 80s, early 90s, 2D state to 3D. For example, like, Street Fighter II and Mortal Kombat were still all the rage, but now there was Virtua Fighter from, from Sega. That was using 3D graphics, and they were just cool. And it was clear that things were going that way. Racing games had gone to 3D. There's some shooting games, like the, uh, Sega was also demoing Virtua Cop. And so we were like, these new consoles that are coming out, they're going to be 3D. Can we make a 3D platform game? No one had ever done it. We'd not seen anything like it. But we're like, but it's got to happen. You got these games like Super Mario World. They sell like 35 million copies. Like, everyone loves them. Everyone plays them. Like, people are going to want to play those in 3D too, and they'll look even cooler. Think about that world or like speeding through as Sonic the Hedgehog doing those loop tubes in 3D. What is that going to look like? Jason and I had sold the distribution publishing rights for Way of the Warrior to Universal Studios, to a new unit called Universal Interactive. They had given us this housekeeping deal, which was sort of an offer that was too good to refuse, like, because they're basically like, come out to California, move on to Universal's lot next to Steven Spielberg, and we'll give you like a bungalow for free and like utilities for free, and you can just do whatever you want, and all you have to do is show it to us. Prior to fall of 1994, Naughty Dog was just Jason and Andy, with the occasional other person who helped out as a work for hire or sometimes a royalty programmer or something to, like maybe they did the PC conversion of one of our games or, or something like that. Now I dug was this partnership. Uh, it always was like, you know, while we, were, while we were there. And it was this synergy between Jason and I. We both did all the creative stuff. We were best of friends. We were roommates. We came up with the ideas. We did the business together. And Jason was a phenomenal artist, very technical artist also, full of ideas. And I was a game programmer, I think a pretty good one. <laughs> and we just, between the two of us, like, he would try to make it, like, look incredible. I would try to make the technology really work and, like, deliver the most. And we both try to make it really fun. So we're driving out to the West Coast. We piled everything. Uh, well, a bunch of stuff went with the movers, but, like, we piled the dog, the naughty dog, Morgan, and ourselves into my Honda Accord, and we drove across the country. And so we had lots of time to talk while we were driving, and we're trying to figure out uh, this next game. We'd talked about it before, but it really sort of gelled somewhere in the Midwest. So we're like, well, what would it be really like to do a platformer in 3D? And we talked about the different platformers, and, like, and we're, we're talking about like Sonic the Hedgehog. Well, Imagine you're going through loops, or you're running and you're jumping platforms or collecting stuff in 3D. And the camera's always behind you. And you see the world, and that looks all great, but it's like the Sonic's ass game. All you do is see Sonic's ass. You're always going to see the back of the character. But the front of the character is where the expression is and stuff. Could we do levels where you come at the camera, but how are you going to see where you're going? Uh, these eventually led actually to the bolder levels in Crash Bandicoot. Should we do levels sideways? Should he look over his shoulder towards the screen? One of the big sort of design quandaries, which took us over a year to crack, uh, was, well, now you're in 3D, and traditionally, your joystick or your joypad is like an axis, and it sort of lines up with the screen. You press the joypad, and you move on the screen in the corresponding way. So there's a very clear mapping of user's intent into the game world. But we're like, well, it's, now it's 3D. So how does the joypad, it's still just four little magnetic contacts, like, and four little switches that hurt your thumb. So 
how is that going to allow you to control in 3D? Which, at, you know, two axes is it controlling? Is it always locked to the camera? Is it always locked to the, how the character's facing? It wasn't until we actually started really programming that and getting into it later in 1994 and early into 95 that we kind of worked through all those things. And there's a lot of different takes on it. It was not so obvious uh, at first. Yeah, so Hollywood housekeeping deal, like, is more or less as follows. They just... They give you, like, office space uh, and, like, phones and electricity and that kind of stuff for however many people you need. And they don't charge you for it. And then part of it was a first look deal. So basically we're working on stuff and they can, like, come in, you know. It's not like they can barge in any time, but they just knock at the door and they're like, hey, or whatever. And you, you just sort of show them the stuff. And then they have the right to, like, to make an offer on it if if you can work things out. But you can just take it. You still have to show it to them, but you could just take it and like go show it to someone else too, and sell it to someone else. Then you might end up losing your housekeeping deal and have to like leave if you actually sold it to someone else. But basically, it's this sort of transitional thing in the where you're building a relationship, sort of building trust, and you're expecting to actually sell it to them. Uh, but meanwhile, your operating costs are low. We still had to pay our employees ourselves, uh, but at first we didn't have any. So it allowed us to have this office, like a real office and like look real, without spending any money, which was all good by us. We're simultaneously designing the game that became Crash Bandicoot and sort of shopping for a platform for it. At the time, there were two platforms that were out, and we knew because it was going to be a 3D game that we wanted to do something on one of the new 32-bit platforms. So there's the 3DO, which we'd already made a game on. The 3DO was, we liked the, pe the people there, but the machine was sort of a clunky half 3D machine. It was also very expensive and wasn't selling very well, and it probably couldn't really do the game we wanted to do. Then there was the Atari Jaguar, which was kind of a, we just sort of took it as a bit of a joke. Uh, it was sort of niche. It was also out, but wasn't selling very well either. And then you had, like, the big guys all about to release new machines. Not instantly, but it's sort of, like, brewing on the horizon. You had some mystery machine from Nintendo, but we had no way of, like, knowing what Nintendo was up to. They just basically didn't talk to Americans. And that was further out, we had heard. And then there was, Sega had two things going on. They had a 32X, which was coming out that fall, which was some kind of, like, we knew way in which you souped up the Genesis. Uh, and the Genesis, we had made a game on the Genesis. It was an awesome machine, and I liked the Genesis. Like, but it was still a very 16-bit 2D machine. We were wondering how they would add 3D to that. And then they were making this new machine that, uh, I don't remember if it was called the Saturn yet, or, but it became the Saturn. And then there was this wild card, Sony. Like, of course, we knew Sony. You know, we had Sony TVs and Sony Walkman and stuff, but like, they hadn't done video games before. But we heard they had this like, powerful new machine. So we contacted both Sega and Sony and got the information on the machines, which they gave us, you have to sign your life away and your firstborn and all that. And I think with, with Sony, well, actually, definitely to get hardware, you had to give them like a $100,000 deposit. If they didn't like you, they could just keep. Uh, but Sony was actually great to work, uh, work, work with, but like, it was actually fairly easy to do. But they did have this thing that I think was basically to separate the, the kids from the, <laughs> from the adults. Uh, and so they would send you the information on their machines and we'd read about them and then you could order the machines if you gave them the deposit and stuff. So uh, I think we had both machines. In fact, I'm sure we did. And I'm reading at them and the, the Saturn is like, it was kind of interesting, but it was also this weird Frankenstein where they had like taken a bunch of arcade hardwares, stripped them down to, for home efficiencies and kind of glued them together. And they really weren't sure about the whole 3D thing. So the Saturn's actually sort of two game machines in one unholy, Siamese twin machine. There's like a 2D one in there and a 3D one in there, and the 3D one is sort of underpowered. Like, it's actually a great machine for, for doing games like Space Harrier or where you're scaling 2D sprites or for scrolling games. And then Sony had this new machine which was like all 3D. It could do 2D pretty well too, but it, it didn't have dedicated 2D hardware. It used the 3D hardware as 2D hardware. And it was like a new clean design, very similar to high-end commercial, 3D hardware like the silicon graphics hardware or something, but with a bunch of simplifications to make it much more economic. Silicon graphics workstations were these fantastically expensive, they ran IRIX, which was a, a variant of Unix. They basically started like 35 grand, could get to half a million dollars easily for the, our, our, our typical sort of workstation that 
that like special effects companies use like the Indigo 2 Extreme, which is we had a lot of. Like that was like basically a hundred thousand dollar machine just for the hardware, and this is compared to like a souped up PC at the time might be like six thousand dollars or something. So it's like very expensive machine, but it had graphics boards. Now, ironically, these graphics boards that they had were fairly similar to like a entry level graphics board you might put in your PC in 1999. But this wasn't 1999. This was 1994. So with the PlayStation, they made a somewhat more sort of 2D triangle rendering graphics unit. And uh, there were two main custom chips in the in the PlayStation 1, a, uh, a graphics unit and a sort of custom MIPS CPU. And this is a standard kind of configuration even today to some extent. So, but the GPUs today are wildly more complicated. They also do a lot of the math work that old GPUs in the 90s did not do. The PlayStation 1 GPU just drew triangles on the screen, but it was pretty good at it. It could draw about 120,000 polygons a second of triangles, which was phenomenal for the time for a consumer piece of, of hardware. If you were using a PC at the time, they had no graphics hardware, or no 3D graphics hardware. They had like VGA boards. You'd be lucky to get a couple hundred polygons because you have to do them all in software. I don't think there were any graphics cards for PCs in 94. By the mid, late 90s, there were some for a couple hundred bucks and they were like similar to what the PlayStation was at this time. But here was the PlayStation, which was gonna be like uh, 199, 299, whatever it was. And it was like a complete machine with a CD drive and with the memory and everything. Like console machines, like compared to PCs at the time, a world of difference. PCs are still a little bit of pain, but they're easy now. But in those days, we're talking Windows 3.1 and DOS. When to run a game, you had, usually had to have a boot disk with like custom auto exec batch and config sys, and you had to open up your machine and write down the hardware addresses of the peripherals in your machine before you could even install your game. I mean, it. This was not a very game-friendly world on PCs. But a PlayStation or a Genesis or uh, a Super Nintendo, you just shoved in the cartridge or the CD, pushed on, boom, it booted. And you just connected it to your TV. So these things were so much more accessible and they cost a lot less. Like kids could use them, the kids weren't gonna break dad's expensive computer or misinstall something or whatever. And it was so much faster. Anyway, so consoles were really very convenient for playing games. I liked the Sony best. It was neat and clean and powerful and intended for 3D. Now, like, I really thought it was the only one of those machines that actually do what we were sort of like aiming at. And by that point, by the time we were analyzing the hardware, we had the game we wanted to make in mind. And it really was pretty close in generalities to what became Crash Bandicoot. The core idea behind Crash Bandicoot as a game was, and all games start from genre, like really what I call mechanic, the gameplay. It was gonna have a mechanic like a game like Donkey Kong Country or Aladdin or Super Mario World. You were gonna go through levels with successive timing challenges and enemies and jumps. It was gonna be platforming and it was gonna have a cartoony animal character and we wanted to not make it look like a video game exactly in the way the video games looked like at that time. Like, to not be as video game, we wanted it to look like a Looney Tunes cartoon or a like, you know, Tex Avery animation where the character was highly animated, fluid. If he got mushed by a giant stone roller, he got turned into a flat thing that waddled around or if he, you know, if he got burned, he crisped up and got blown away by the wind or someone swept him up with a magic pail of, you know, dustbin and and in that very cartoon kind of way. We wanted a world that like looked like a cartoon world with a kind of sensibility that was like classic cartoons or sort of it was being reinvented at the time with TV shows like DuckTales and Animaniacs. Animaniacs was hot. Like then there was an animation revival going on. Beavis and Butthead had recently hit. Uh, South Park was to come like two years later, like The Simpsons was big, and there were different styles of animation, and we liked the classic Looney Tunes style, but, and it, oh, and also Disney had sort of come out of its doldrums and had recently released, you know, Little Mermaid, uh, Beauty and the Beast, Lion King, Aladdin, like, 
animation was cool again. It was able to sort of bring to life these sort of fantasy characters in a kind of fun way that like people could really relate to. So we were convinced that if we could make it look like one of those Looney Tunes cartoons, how could they not like the character and relate to it? Because those guys are all likable, you know, even surly, yeah. sarcastic guys like Bugs or, you know, uh, whatever, because they're just so cute <laughs> in their cartoony way. So early on, uh, you know, we had this vision of the sort of living cartoon that with the sort of intense, fast-paced platform gameplay. And one of the sort of synergies, and there were relatively few, turned out to be relatively few synergies, like working in a studio and not working in film or television. But like, one of them was that we could easily like talk to professionals, like, you know, who do contract work, like sound guys and designers and stuff. And so we, uh, we interviewed a whole mess of different cartoon designers. And we settled on these two guys, uh, Charles Zimbalist and Joe Pearson, super talented, experienced cartoon guys. They had worked for like Hanna Barbera and done a lot of character and background work on on shows that we had liked. Uh, like Charles had done a bunch of character stuff on DuckTales, which is great characters, like uh, just really iconic style ones. And then we sort of explain, you know, we contract them, had them in. We sort of explained the characters and. And uh, stuff like Crash, already we knew he was this sort of Australian animal. We had picked this idea because we wanted to co-opt like a real animal, but like make him our own character. And we had Dr. Cortex as this silly uh, villain and stuff. And we explained them to them and they drew them basically. And they just knew how to draw everything as a cartoon. So it came out looking like something from the world of Who Framed Roger Rabbit or uh, whatever. And it's like, oh my God, that's awesome. Or he's awesome, but... He's got, what's with that silly hat? Take off the silly hat or put on a new, maybe he should have gloves or, oh, Dr. Cortex needs the villain gloves. He's a, he's an evil genius. He has to have the villain gloves. You know, those like sort of dish gloves that villain, cartoon villains always have. And should he have an evil mustache? You know, like it's the villain beard because it's actually a 17th century thing after Guy Fox, like the sort of classic villain beard. So that helped bring this idea to life. And we see so we're doing that and we're simultaneously trying to get We've got a PlayStation prototype, and we're trying to figure out how to actually make it work in reality. Now, the character wasn't, that actually went fairly smoothly, like making this moderately low polygon version. Uh, he was actually like 600 originally polygons, which given that in Crash 1, we actually, in a frame, they were 30 frames a second, and we got about 1,500 polygons on the screen, and 600 of them went to Crash. That's how important he was to us. Like most people, they'd use like 80, and so their characters would look like weird walking blocks. We wanted him to look like a real cartoon character. That required a lot of detail. So he gets a third of the entire budget just for that, the main character. You know, he's the protagonist. It's all about him. But we, we want to make these incredible looking worlds, and so Joe primarily was drawing where like, you know, we knew it was gonna be on this imaginary sort of island near Tasmania or something, and we we're like describing, and he's drawing these lush jungles and the totem things and caves with mine cars and all these classic video gamey kind of things, and they look gorgeous in the in his color sketches, and we're like, we're gonna make those, but then we had to figure out how to actually do that and get into the PlayStation. With Crash, we were forging into new ground everywhere. Like, no one had ever made a 3D uh, platform action game, and I'm not sure that anyone had ever really made background scenes and levels that were actually interactive and rendered in real time at the, the detail level that we were trying to do. We had these sort of paper templates, these drawings of like lush jungles and, and stuff. First, we were trying to figure out, well, let's, how do we get them into the computer? Well, it was completely obvious that PCs, which were the standard thing that people would use for development machines, were just not going to cut it. They hadn't, you know, again, it's Windows 3.1 and no 3D graphics. And the things had like effectively 640K of RAM. Like, you might have a little bit extra, but that's a long, boring story from the 90s. So we made the plunge to buy, for everyone in the company, which was about five people at this, at this stage, Silicon Graphics workstations, mostly Indigo 2 Extremes. Uh, these are like seventy-five to $100,000 workstations. They had 3D graphics. The software to do the 3D graphics was also like about $75,000 per machine, plus like some yearly firstborn <laughs> tithe. Uh, 
But this is what people had done in recent, very recent memory of the time, Terminator 2 or The Abyss or even Jurassic Park on. Like, it was the only thing where 3D graphics was really sort of done in, in, in a serious way. And so we settled on using as our software alias Power Animator, which is one of the three choices <laughs> at the time. And Jason first cr started creating this jungle. It just became instantly obvious that you couldn't just build a jungle like we intended in Power Animator. It was designed for shots in movies like Jurassic Park where they would do elements and then they would render the elements and they would composite them. And so you couldn't make a gigantic scene and nothing was instanced. Like every, you had to sort of massage every polygon individually and it was not really not intended for you to come back to it and like rework it. Like, I don't think they do that. I'm, I've never been on a, a special effects team on a movie, but like, I don't think they really do a ton of it, highly iterative rework. I think they make their shot, get it right, and, and move on. We needed like a way in which you could use, for memory reasons and for efficiency reasons, like the same tree. Like, so we would make like five trees, and then the jungle would be all those same five trees, but all rotated around and scaled differently, and maybe colored differently, so that we didn't have to go make a thousand trees. We didn't have like enough guys and enough time to make a thousand trees. We wanted to make five trees or 10 trees and decorate them up <laughs> into, but video games are big. Like you go through a large level and if you, if you play Super Mario World, well, you run past the same mushroom hundreds of times or there's the five mushrooms or whatever it is, but like that's the way video games are made. And there was just no way to do that in Power and you couldn't even stick that many things in the level and have it like even run, fit in the memory on the SGI. So that was one of our first problems and one of our programmers, uh, uh, Dave, sol solved it with all the work was working on it by making this tool by which the artist could make the individual elements in individual files like the trees and whatever. And then there was this giant script and like Photoshop files by which it explained how to combine them all into the level. And it said, you know, this this tree, this is tree number one, and like, and it was actually assigned to a color, and it was painted on the, the image, and they would paint that, and you'd paint the height of the ground, and there was part of this tool that he had, which would generate the ground with like, uh, the, the colors from the Photoshop layers, like, as the height, and it would like, build, you'd run it, and it would build the level. And so then if you, if you wanted to build it again, but you wanted to make that hill a little shorter, you went in and edited the Photoshop thing, changed the colors a bit, made it shorter, and you reran the tool, and it would build the level again from scratch. Like, and let's say in that same time you would change the tree to like, you know, make it a little taller or whatever, it would like put the new tree in when it, uh, when it built it. So it sort of did this whole process, and it would output it in chunks, because Power Animator couldn't even load the whole level that this thing output like up into memory, it would, it would chop it up into like 16 parts or something and like then you could load the pieces in. Like so the artists might, if they want to look at it, like load two pieces in and like look at just that part and see how it came out. Because you could load them back into, into Power Animator and you could like sort of fly around them in 3D on the SGI and sort of see what your world looked like. So the way it works when you're working on a video game machine that has not come out, and this is fall of 94, but the PlayStation shipped in fall of 95 and our game shipped in fall of 96, is you get this sort of like early version for, of the machine, which isn't quite perfect, but it's sort of mostly, maybe about 80% of the machine. So we got this like clunky big box, which was like the early PlayStation like prototype. And it turned out to be a pretty good machine, but first you gotta like understand it because it comes with a bunch of, like a bunch of manuals which are incredibly badly translated from the Japanese and are mysterious and you'd have amusing debates between the programmers what they actually meant by the funny choice of English words. These days they, they get better translations, but 30 years ago, not so much. But the way to really figure out what's new is to test things empirically. So I understand how video game machines are supposed to be designed. And first, you, in reading the instructions, you kind of have to understand what the hardware designers who built this machine intended to be the way it was to be used. Now, you might not use it exactly that way. You're gonna get the best performance out of the machine by using it in a way that's relatively close to the intent. Now, they don't ever come out and just say this. You have to sort of infer it. And then you have to figure out if what they claim that, they, that it can do is actually the case. And, so you, you do that by taking the individual pieces and you write test code to do certain things on the machine and put it through its paces. It's like you know taking a car out on the track and seeing how fast it can actually corner without crashing and burning. Fortunately, with the, with the PlayStation, 
if you overtax it, it just runs slower, overheats or something. It doesn't explode and spray out over all the spectators. So I ran graphics tests, and surprisingly, the graphics hardware in the machine actually was able to render about the number of polygons that they claimed. Uh, but there's a bunch of different graphics modes, and so test it in the normal resolution, test it in the high resolution mode, test had this weird resolution mode in the middle, and like, you know, find interesting discoveries. Well, it's like half speed in the high resolution mode. But in the mid resolution mode, which was clearly just sort of an afterthought, it's the same speed as the low resolution mode. It's like, hmm, well, it seems like maybe that mode might be interesting. You can render polygons with textures, without textures, with shading, without shading, and you, you, you try these and see how like, because they always give the best case, basically, when they give the numbers. Like, so do they give the case for, like, all unshaded flat polygons, which aren't that useful? Or do they give it for textured ones or whatever? It turned out that actually they, they give a fairly proper uh, number. And it, and, but the polygons without textures drew about twice as fast. Well, when you have a relatively small number of polygons, twice is a lot faster. Uh, but then when you do tests, like, for example, Jason had already made this Crash Bandicoot character, who looks pretty much the same as the final Crash Bandicoot character. And so I had that draw on the screen, and we shrank it down to about the size it would be on the screen. I ran some code to actually calculate the number of pixels that each of his polygons occupied on the screen, and it turned out they were like, the average was like 1.2 pixels. So I'm like, well, why would we texture these polygons? We needed a lot of polygons because we wanted Crash to be fluid and smooth and to animate well. And you can only you can't animate within a polygon. You can only animate the polygons. So you need if you want them to bend nicely or be rounded, you need a lot of polygons. But if there are only a couple pixels, what good do textures do? So we decided for characters, let's not use the texture mode. Let's just use the faster, easier to use shaded mode, which most people didn't do. Most people just use textures. And part of this is because we ran the tests and found that the, the non-texture mode ran twice as fast. Like if you didn't run the tests, you just sort of like use the numbers in the book, it just gave you one number. We figured out that PlayStation could actually draw a pretty decent number of polygons per second from the graphics hardware. But you have to do the math to figure out where those polygons are gonna be. So it's called vertex transforms. Uh, in computer graphics, and that requires doing a ton of multiplying and adding, which is something computers are very good at, but they have specialized hardware to do it. These days, that stuff is all done, like almost every computer, and even your phone, have advanced GPUs, and they have vertex units, and they do tremendous numbers, gigaflops often, of multiply adds. But in those days, like most computers, just did the multiply, multiplies and adds one at a time on the CPU, and they could do like, hundreds or thousands, like not billions. Somewhere in, in here, the designers had, had put hardware that was designed to do multiply ads because you need to do millions of them. But this was all hidden behind a bunch of like C programming language libraries that Sony had, which you gave them the, the numbers and it multiply added them. And those things performed terribly. While the graphics unit could get a hundred, small, hundred, you know, hundred, 120,000, somewhere in that range, uh, polygons per second drawn. The libraries could only transform the math for them uh, for maybe like 5,000, 10,000, which was just not going to cut it because your numbers go down really rapidly as you're making a, a interactive game. You're gonna need at least 30 frames a second to make a decent video game. 60 would be better, but 60 wasn't really possible with early 3D games. It is now. most. PlayStation 4 games run in 60. So the base tested performance on Vertex Math on the PlayStation 1 using the official Sony way of doing it, calling their graphics libraries, was like at least an order of magnitude off, like one-tenth of what it should be. It just didn't run fast enough. This was a serious problem. One of our overriding goals with Crash, it, it, you really think of it in sort of graphical kind of gameplay technology way. There was like a background problem. We wanted these super lush detailed worlds. And there was a foreground problem, which was we wanted characters in here that looked like Looney Tunes or like Disney quality animation. Uh, and that meant that the characters had to really animate. Not uh, in traditionally in sort of low polygon 90s era 3D graphics, you would make your your characters by constructing a very small number, maybe single digit, double digit, small double digits, number of bones, like 
upper arm bone, lower arm bone, head bone, chest bone, two chest bones, upper leg bone, right, right. and you would stick all of the art that pertained to that character's upper right leg on the upper right leg bone. And the bone was like a rigid thing. It could be turned, like a rotate, it was like a joint. It could be rotated or moved, but nothing within it could change. Like you could actually scale it, but you didn't do that that much. So what this meant was that if someone's arm was animating, it could kind of go like And if you wanted fingers, you had to have like lots of bones. You could do the cheap, you could do mitt or sometimes kind of like this, or you could put one bone per finger, that then they're like stiff, or they're, in, they're all like this, but they can, they can maybe move individually. If you wanted individual fingers, you needed tons of bones. That was just too much math for the PlayStation handle. We just knew it could never handle tons of bones. And even if you had the tons of bones, there was a bunch of problems. Like the polygons that were on one joint and the one that were on the other joint would sort of like rub into each other so there'd be gaps between the bones as they moved. It didn't look very good. It looked all like weird and flickery or like holes in the character. That's not very realistic, like, or cartoony. And you certainly couldn't do something like, say he gets his hand hit by a hammer in a cartoon. Well, what happens? It swells up like a balloon and then pops and goes You know, like, that's a proper cartoon thing to have happen to your hand when it gets hit by a hammer, or it gets flattened into a pancake and something like that. We well, just couldn't do that at all with the whole bone system. A game like Virtual Fighter in the arcade used the classic bone system. Now, this worked okay for a fighting game because there's not a lot, ton of deformation, but the characters are a little stiff. And a game, uh, contemporous with Crash that was being worked on at the same time as ours, it wasn't out when we were making our game, uh, would be like the original Tomb Raider. Lara Croft would be, she's pretty stiff. She doesn't have any, with bones it's almost impossible or very difficult to do facial animation to, and we knew we really wanted facial animation. What kind of cartoon character doesn't like smirk or wink or scrunch his face up or any of that kind of emotive stuff and it's just like, well, it's not a very interesting cartoon character. This was another problem because Jason, who's the, as the primary artist and the animator, he would use the really advanced non-real-time tools on the Silicon Graphics workstation and take his crash model and make him do cute things like, like smile and wink at us and like stick his thumb in his mouth and blow his head up like a balloon. And the way that the that power animator did those things, that you would do them in computer graphics, was just not possible on the PlayStation. It did them by having like 200 bones, like you could maybe support like 10 <laughs> on the PlayStation. It did them by having vertices belong to, mul to multiple bones simultaneously interpolate between them, just impossible on the PlayStation basically. It had like deformation matrices and fields where you could like make sort of arbitrary shapes, like almost like warp space and like apply, push that through the character. These are all things that used the expensive floating point hardware that was on the, the Silicon Graphics workstation, and it couldn't even do them in real time. It had to render them. Like you animated them, and then you pressed render, and then it took like 30 minutes to like render a two second video uh, with all this animation. But it looked great, but a video game is real time. You have to do everything in a 30th of a second. So this was another big problem, because he wanted that animation really, really bad. When we were making Crash Bandicoot in 94 and 95, no one had ever done a 3D platform action game. Actually, sort of in 95, a few mediocre examples were dribbling out. Uh, the mediocre examples were like Jumping Jack Flash and was it Croc? Maybe Croc was out a little earlier than us. Let me step back and explain gameplay in the 2D platformer. Let's take Donkey Kong Country as a perfect example, but it's Donkey Kong Country borrows heavily from you know, its own predecessors like Super Mario World and so on. So you run through a level, you can move forward and backward in the level, like le which is sort of left and right, and you can jump up and down or jump up on a platform. And, but essentially it's kind of linear. Usually you go to the right and obstacles come to you. So simple obstacles like platforms with spiky pits beneath them. You jump over the spikes, you land on the platforms. This goes all the way back to like Pitfall in like 1980. You might swing on a vine to swing over so a bunch of spiky things. The platforms might move, so you might have to time where they are. Uh, monsters like 
other gorillas or spiky turtles or whatever maybe crawling on the platforms or bees flying above which can kill you if you run into them and you either have to jump on them to kill them or spin or or shoot them or knock something into them or just avoid them or whatever so it's a linear progression you can see where you're going and it's sort of t very fast paced it's like jump jump strike jump jump strike 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 jump uh, grab the vine, swing, get off at exactly that right point, make sure to jump on the bee in the air and bounce off the bee to land on that other platform. So it's all kind of nicely lined up in 2D. The designer measures out this almost rhythmic musical progression of the game. This is one of the things that makes these games really addictive and fun. Your progress in getting better at the game is to first learn the controls, to get good at being Donkey Kong and or being Crash Bandicoot later, uh, later and then to learn the specific movements of the enemies and the objects in the level and learn the specific patterns in this particular level and sort of memorize a route. There may be multiple routes that work, but you, you've got your pattern that you're going through and, and you're like, and it's like, it's almost like playing back like in a rhythm game or a piece, it's like, it's this jump, jump, strike, jump, jump, strike, you know, kind of, kind of thing and the pattern is difficult. And the part of the designer's goal is to make an interesting kind of pattern that's got like intense moments and relaxed moments and stuff like that. This is not totally obvious to the player, but the intensity of it is. In 3D, everything's different. You've added an extra dimension. So your extra dimension is not the up and down, which you already had before, and the left and right's analogous to sort of forward and backward. You've now got this side to side too. If you've got, in Donkey Kong Country, or Mario, whatever, if three turtles are coming at you, you have to jump over or kill or knock away each of the turtles in succession. There's no going around them. The jumping over is a kind of going around, but there's no going in front of them or behind them. In 3D, you can just go to the right and avoid them entirely. It's too much space, basically. Suddenly, the number of guys you have on screen doesn't dramatically increase, but you've added a whole extra dimension to the space, and so, there's too much empty space. And we had to figure out how to make, how to compensate for that so in order to maintain the ratio of challenge to choice. The platform action game is really all about action and this sort of intense rhythm to it. And as they made the transition from 2D to 3D, this extra dimension introduced more space. And this had the, the effect of sort of diluting the, the ratio between choice and conflict in the game or choice and obstacle. And we had to figure out how to compensate for this in order to maintain the intense action pace. Truth is that 3D was like a real break point for many video game teams um, at so many levels. It separated the men from the boys because there were all these makers of video games who made great 2D games where they weren't technically that awesome or or they were just a little hack, but they made really good game, like they had good game design, and but you did just didn't need to know that much math, like with 2D games. When you got in 3D, the math went, you had a lot of linear algebra and trigonometry, uh, and even quite a bit of imaginary, like particularly by the PlayStation 2, like of imaginary math, like uh, good animation in the later era, like by the PlayStation 2 era, involves like flipping things into the imaginary space and and all the compression stuff that is often into into sort of vector quantization and other kind of like mathematically complex spaces that like some of these skilled gameplay programmers like that didn't have formal training or came from an older era and didn't know that much math like just die it's like the shoals that their ships wrecked against you know but we paid intense attention to everyone else, at least in our genre, and anyone else of significance. A lot of this development was in Asia, like in Japan and stuff, and so you would get bits, glimpses, like, and there was no internet of any substance at this time, like, there was an internet, but it didn't have this stuff on it. So, uh, you know, sometimes we would go over to Tokyo Game Show and, like, videotape, <laughs> or, yeah, that kind of thing, and already, like, those trade shows are actually really important for, like, getting early glimpses of what was going on. Like, like that was where you saw Mario six months before it was launched. Yeah. You know, we would look at every magazine. We had subscriptions to all the Japanese, like, video game magazines because they were always, like, 
more in advance of the U.S. ones. And we'd eagerly, like, look through them, like, the day they came. During Crash Bandicoot, like, it was, we were very nervous about the competition, and particularly on the PlayStation, but also across the other, the other machines and stuff. And so we were checking out everything in platform. Actually. And at first we were quite nervous, but as it... As it progressed, like, for a while, it, uh, you know, it was like, ah, no one else is, you know, there's other great-looking games, but in this genre, it's like, and as we struggled with these difficult problems, it was like, uh, we're like, well, maybe there's a reason why there's not so many other people doing it. And the, the examples that came out, like, were, like, kind of terrible. Probably the first inkling of real competition came out maybe, like, six months before we launched. Now, Crash was almost done. But when we saw, like, initial footage from, like, Tokyo Game Show of Mario 64... Now, it was a different machine with different pluses and minuses, and we're like, oh, that looks different. That looks pretty cool. Miyamoto's a genius. <laughs> that was a reoccurring, like, you know, notion. Like, we always studied all the existing games. Like, uh, Yoshi's Island came out during the development of Crash, and we played that incessantly to sort of, not for its technological stuff, but for its sort of really intricate and awesome gameplay design. Crash had sort of two phases of stressdom uh, during Crash 1. The first phase, which was about a year, was can we make this thing work at all? It was not until July or August of 1995, almost a year after we began production, that we had a level that was even remotely playable in a fun way. And there were two major test levels which were like abject failures. Just total disasters. <laughs> I mean, they had interesting elements and aren't in the game at all. Like some of those are on the web because I actually left them on the disc on purpose. Like, and some guys have resurrected. They weren't. It wasn't possible to get them. They gave it some hackers have resurrected them. Uh, it's a bit of archaeology. But there was a jungle, and there was this sort of lava cave in the jungle. Like we would have never fit in in memory. It like it was way too wide open. It looked really cool, but like. The frame rate was abysmal, and like there was just like no gameplay at all, and there was like no way that we could see. Like that's where we discovered the the problem of this extra degree of freedom, and like the fact that like we didn't know how to make like the gameplay fun. You could just avoid everything really easily. And then we're like, okay, let's make a much simpler level and try to make that fun. That was this lava level, and it was better. It could like actually run at sort of a barely acceptable like frame rate. We thought maybe we could get that to run fast enough, but it f played terribly, like again, because of this thing. And also because of this other problem we discovered, which had to do with the mapping of the joystick into the three, from 2D into the three-dimensional world and the judgment of, spa of depth. Like if you're playing a 2D action game and you're judging how far you got to jump to make it over the spiky pit, it's kind of straightforward because you're only really judging your movement in one dimension. But in 3D, and you're like looking over the shoulder of the character, you're judging this sort of funny angle that may be changing. Like if the camera's rotating and stuff, like the angle between the character and the ground is basically adjusting. And then you're trying to judge like, well, how far is that pit? And which way do I press the joypad to actually go most straightforwardly across the pit, not kind of go diagonally where you're going to end up in the middle middle of the pit. So in this one, you had to keep jumping across these lava stretches between pillars, and no one could make the jumps. Eventually, we came up, to some, came up with some solutions to this problem, but for a while, we're like, oh, can you even make this work? Can it be fun? And can we do it? In the summer of 1995, we, uh, Mark, who was our executive producer, was like, guys, you got to make a fun level. And so we actually drew up plans for three new levels with three different strategies for fun, learning the lessons from the two failed levels. And we made all three that summer. And actually all three turned out to be pretty good. And they all three are in the final game. One of the ones which was a sort of over the shoulder type level was the, it, it's in one of the ways, one of the worst levels like in the shipped game, but it's not bad, it's like okay. Like, cause we learned some more lessons from that. But actually we, we got those three levels and two of those levels were really fun. So we're like, whew, thank God. <laughs> like, we've made two fun levels. If you can make two fun levels, then you can make a whole game. Because at the worst case, you just make more of those, like with the same basic ideas, but different creatures and different layouts and different looks or whatever. We ended up doing a lot more variety than that. But like, that was the worst case. You can milk two different gameplay styles into a whole game. Uh, 
in the end, we kept coming up with more and more because Crash 1 has gameplay styles, has side-scroller levels, it has what I consider XZ levels, like which are uh, where you sort of run around, kind of not exactly from the top, but the camera's a little high. It's got into and out, like kind of levels, like some of the sewer levels and or the classic, the first level in the game, like the beach level. It's got levels like the boulder levels where you come at the camera, and it's got forced motion levels like the hog race levels. Uh, and oh, and it even has the water river levels where you're on that surfboardy thing, like. And it may ha- it may have another type or two, but like that's a lot of different kind of core types in a game that only really needed thirty ish levels. So once we had the three that kind of worked, we're like, okay, we've we've got the formula down. We can make this game work. Now, where the original plan had been to ship that Christmas ninety five, everyone knew that wasn't going to happen because we just barely got to what's called first playable, where we have, you have some fun things. So it was more like next, uh, I think we hoped by like next spring or summer or something, but it ended up being September of 96. So then it's like turns into how painful is it going to be and how much money is it going to cost? Like as time equals money, like to get enough levels done to make a great game and polish it up and fix all the bugs. And you really need quite a bit of time in a platform game of this sort to just polish, to like make sure the game is really even in pacing and smooth and there aren't a lot of bugs, whatever. That makes the difference between a B game and an A game. Call it like August 1 or somewhere in August by 95, at least we're like, we're out of the woods. It's just a matter of time and money. That's a much better and less stressful place to be in than can we make this work at all. So at this point, summer 95, it's still just Universal. Universal is our publisher. And mostly that there were two of them, really, that we interacted with. There's the biz guy, Rob Benias, and then there's Mark Cerny, who is technical in design and uh, awesome. Mark had, you know, he was lead programmer in Sonic 2. He had written Marvel Madness. Like, Mark was realistic about what could actually be done. The biz guys didn't really <laughs> know much about it. So we were okay with Into the Spring. But uh, Jason and I's secret plan <laughs> was we had... Early on in making it, we had this totally arrogant half hope, half idea that, well, so, and it was another major factor in choosing the PlayStation, was that Nintendo has Mario and Sega has Sonic. Sony doesn't seem to have a mascot. So if we make a mascot game, style game, on the Sony machine, we might not have the same competition. Because we make one on... For the Saturn, we made Crash for the Saturn, there was going to be Sonic, was our assumption. Now, strangely, I have no idea why, and catastrophically, stupidly, in retrospect, Sega didn't make a Sonic game. I mean, I think they eventually did, but, like, Nintendo did the obvious thing, and they launched the machine with, with Mario 64, and it was a work of genius. Somehow, Sega didn't quite understand what Nintendo intuitively knew was that exclusive cell hardware. Now, Sony totally understands this now, I don't think, I think at that time, Sony had this more open model. So they weren't really working on almost anything internally. They had some things they were sort first party, like Twisted Metal. They took a more first party, third party approach to it. And they didn't really want to work on a mascot. But we had this idea, once these three levels were like, like they looked really good and they were really fun. I and Taylor, who was another of our employees, spent like three days in, Taylor used to, be an editor for Sequest DSV. We took like several hours of crash footage and edited it into a two minute or four minute tape, beta SP tape, set to Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. It was great. We edited it to every like, you know, Rite of Sp- Spring has those like bombastic, discordant, like kind of like instrumental hits, like, and we timed like every jump and strike of crash, like it was a super edited. Because the footage was not great raw. Like, it was a good game, but it was, like, there was a lot of sparseness. But we, it was intensely edited, so it's like, ba-bink, ba-bink, ba-bink. He's, like, hitting monster, jumping to every note in the, in the piece. And this tape looked, it was like, wow. Because you had this super intense-looking, really great graphics, like, cartoony, like, gameplay. And they're supposed with, like... Snippets, they were rendered on the PlayStation, but they were like not quite in the game in the exact way of animation Jason had done and stuff. 
and it's all edited out in time, like nice and easy. And then so we took this tape and gave it to that same friend who had given us insight in the hardware, but who was like very friendly with top Sony brass and was like, show this to Mr. Kutaragi. He did, and like, and some of the other top Sony guys, and they're like, what is that game? Like, they didn't even know it was in development. I mean, it was, we had a contract for it, but like our, we had this weird deal with Sony where we just given them our deposit with the money and like they gave us a machine and we didn't have to really show them anything because we actually didn't have any rights to publish the game. It was this weird development contract that like no one else had. And it was like, you can make the game for the platform, but in it, it said like, but you can't publish it whatsoever. You have to come back to us and show it to us. And if we feel like it, we, you know, we might, allow it to be accepted, or you have to give it to some publisher who has a development deal, and then they can submit it to us and whatever. Because normally Sony Games had all the submit it, submittal process. But so we were this like wild card, like working off in the background. And then there was this fairly immediate buzz where, where they're like, we have to have this game. Like, we have to make sure it's like only on the, the PlayStation and like, because it's better looking than, than anything else we've seen in development. Like, get it. We never thought it would work. It was like a prayer, like a dream. Like we deliberately set up to be in the position to maybe do it, and then we sort of instigated it. Like, but that it worked out was like kind of miraculous. I mean, it was a symbiosis because it worked out exceedingly well for Sony as well. <laughs> uh, but our dream was to become the mascot. Now Sony never even, even when they bought it, they never like officially, they're like, oh, it's not a mascot. We don't have a mascot, like, and whatever. But like everyone assumed it was a mascot. And they got so behind it that they just bought the rights from Universal. The goal of our secret half hope, half plan thing was to get Sony to sort of officially or unofficially adopt Crash Bandicoot as its mascot. At that time in Naughty Dog, uh, we always saw as our job with any particular console hardware as like trying to squeeze the absolute most out of it. The hardware was the hardware and you couldn't do too much about that. But whatever it could do, that was kind of yours. It owed it to you, regardless of what you were supposed to do. So there was this fundamental problem that in the, the PlayStation sort of hardware software interaction where its math side was just not up to snuff. But we kind of knew that this was a software issue, that like Sony just wanted us to use these libraries like that they had written, but they weren't really like using the machine to its fullest. Uh, so we kind of did what, you know, any sort of good scientist does, and you just sort of take it apart. We just sort of systematically tried to figure out like what the designers had actually put in that box to do the math, and got enough of that figured out that I knew that there was like actually some real horsepower in there, but they were kind of like hi hiding it away. And then uh, with that particular problem through a a series of campaigns through some of the guys I knew at Sony kind of work on it and, until the sort of creative solution uh, on both the sides turned out to be like, here's how it works. Two pieces of paper slid under the, across the desk. You didn't hear it from me. <laughs> you know, these were two pieces of paper on this sort of math unit in the hardware in Japanese with a few English translation scribbled next to them. But that was actually enough. Like, because I then sat down with that guy, I actually got Mark Cerny to fully translate the, uh, the Japanese, which was still even somewhat mystifying to him, even though he's completely fluent. <laughs> Not the clearest document. But any, in any case, we just sort of systematically worked through what was on there and like built up our own documentation, how it worked and tested. And it turned out that there was this little sort of math side brain, it's called a coprocessor, in the, inside the Sony's custom CPU, which actually could do this very specific limited math that was needed uh, to do the vertex transformation uh, and could actually do it just about the speed that the, the GPU could consume it. In a way, the, the whole hardware of the PlayStation 1 is actually an extremely nicely balanced machine. It's got its few little flaws, but it's at a good design for the time because they're working with a lot of constraints in hardware design where they've got to make this thing that they can build cheaply in enormous numbers at whatever point in sort of techno you know, technological history they're working on. And it has this particular job of like running video games 
And that's a complex job with a lot of tests. It's got to like move data off wherever it is, like on the CD. It's got to have just enough memory, but memory is really expensive. So it's got to have enough bandwidth between the different parts of the system. It's got to have like enough sound capability to do a decent job, enough graphics to do, you know, a decent job, enough math to support that, enough general CPU to support that. It's got to be flexible enough and like do different things different ways. Like, and it's actually a very nice design for the time like pretty well balanced. Like the hardware engineers really knew what they were, they were doing. In pretty much every dedicated gaming hardware since the beginning of arcade games in like, you know, the 1978, 79 timeframe, there's always been kind of two main brands, sometimes three and some other things, but, but two pretty much always there main brands in dedicated gaming hardware. You've got the graphics unit and you got the CPU. Now all computers have CPUs. Like, and game machines in older days would tend to use standard off-the-shelf CPUs, like a game like Pac-Man probably used a 6502, which was the same CPU in the Apple II and the Atari 800 or whatever. Like, they were standard, you know, parts and likes of Intel or Motorola and stuff. And then the graphics unit, because graphics is a more game-specific area, was developed basically all of computer graphics technology has been driven by the video game. Like, there's other things that help it out influence, but it was born in service uh, of video games, like, and developed as a sort of, like, hardware software art in service of video games to a somewhat lesser extent, maybe, like, you know, film animation or something like that. But really, video games are the big one. So early on, even in the 80s, machines like Pac-Man or whatever actually had... GPUs of sorts, or even the old Atari 2600 had a GPU. And it was some way in which it renders its graphics like in hardware. Because CPUs, like particularly old CPUs, move individual numbers. They're very general, but they can do things like take two, take two numbers out of different places in memory, add them together, put them back in another piece of memory. If it's, this one's bigger than 100, do something else. That's what CPUs do. And that allows them to do anything that computers can do. But they, they, it's like they have one thought at a time. They just sort of march through this. Now, modern ones have multiple cores. They can do a few thoughts, but they're not massively parallel. And those really old ones, like in the 80s, they could basically do no graphics in the CPU. It would be very difficult. But early 80s games, even something like Galaga or whatever, where like the aliens are sweeping down, those are what are called sprites. Well, those were draw the CPUs at the time could not draw sprites. These little graphics units like were designed to do sprites and scrolling backgrounds. Machines like the home machines, which evolved from arcade machines, you know, use this, these same hardware strategies, and even the same parts. For example, the Sega Genesis is basically a golden axe. Like, if any of you remember the golden axe arcade game, a Sega game, great game. It's a move to the right and slash game, and a brawl, sort of a four-player brawler. And they took the hardware that in the arcade, like the sort of graphics hardware paired with um, 68,000 CPU, typical Motorola CPU, same ones in the original Macintosh. They made the Golden Axe game, and then when they when they went to design a home machine, they're like, well, maybe we can just take the Golden Axe hardware and we can miniaturize a bit, and we'll take out a little of the memory, and we'll trim down some things and make it run a little slower, and that's a genesis. Every game has to run on the same Golden Axe hardware. But in the early days of arcade games, each there would be families of arcade GPUs that did different things, like 2D ones, then three half, they do, like Sega had ones for like Space Harrier that did scaling and then 3D ones and so on. And there's really early, Atar some Atari had some really early 3D ones like for, um, I can't remember what it was called, but some racing games and stuff. But where we're talking about with the PlayStation is an era where there's no 3D graphics boards for PCs yet. They're these high-end workstation things, but arcade games have already started for a few years before going into 3D. And so Japanese CPU companies like like Toshiba and stuff, had been working on GPUs to do the graphics for these advanced new 3D arcade games. The same companies, you know, worked under contract for like Sony and, and whatnot, producing smaller, more mass production versions for machines like the PlayStation. And, and so on. Later, as the PC graphics market really heated up, like the two main players today, and uh, NVIDIA and AMD, and they're basically the only people who, well, Intel also has some, but high, less performance uh, GPUs. But you always had this balance in these machines between their sort of graphics brain and their sort of general and sort of math brain. 
And the balance has shifted over the years with modern GPUs absorbing more and more of the sort of graphic specific types of math. And even now, under various APIs, like under Windows or, or using like Metal and some of the computational APIs under graphic, uh, you can use the, the GPU processors like to, to do all sorts of things. Like when you go render a ProRes video or whatever, like a lot in Final Cut Pro or something, these days that will run mostly, uh, if you've got a decent GPU, on the GPU. They have two versions of the code, a CPU version and GPU version. And because those graphics units nowadays can do in parallel sometimes thousands of these same operations. You know, you can do one thing at a time uh, on one piece of data or you can do the same thing on lots of data which is called like parallel programming. And there's been a movement in hardware design towards more parallelism. That's why the actual sort of processing power on a GPU is way more than a CPU. Like they have many gigaflops like these days, or even teraflops on some of them. But they don't do as general stuff. One of the great things about design for consoles, and I was originally a PC game programmer, uh, as all old game programmers were, unless they were arcade winner, but moving to consoles, but the console had this fixed hardware. It was designed for video games, and you knew what you were getting. Yes, you had very small amounts of memory. Yes, you had this specific GPU and this specific CPU, but that was actually kind of freedom. It's like writing a sonnet and knowing that you're going to stick to Shakespeare's sonnet rules. You don't have to worry, well, does this guy have this one and this guy have this? No, everyone has the same one. It's the PlayStation 1. It's always the same and it was at least designed for games. But because you've got the same, it's like, well, how can I get the most, the absolute most out of this specific thing? And you also know that, like, realistically, if you try some weird hack and it works, then it will, like, kind of work on all the PlayStations, even though you're really not supposed to do it. So we do all sorts of weird hacks. Like, memory was so short in Crash Bandicoot that I took to stealing little bits and pieces of extra memory from the Sony libraries. I would like just try erasing parts of them that I thought I wasn't using and see if, the, if things still worked. And if they, if they did, I would mark them as available and then like stick my own stuff on top of their, like there was like parts of the memory where the operating system had loaded in various parts of it, but I wasn't using all of the operating system, only some parts of it. Like, so I just stuck my own stuff on top of their code. And I just knew that like, because your, the oper your copy operating system is shipped on your disk, so it was always going to be that same copy. If they changed it, then I would go figure out what I could use again and you know, change my program a little bit. But you were definitely not supposed to do that. And it caused problem in, problems like that they had to work around on the emulators on like later machines like the PlayStation 2 and stuff, where they had to specifically, because they wanted Crash Bandicoot to run, they had to specifically like, make it work for my weird hacks. It was free memory. <laughs> the memory was finite. It's like, well, if it works, it works, and I'll just test it empirically. And if it doesn't work, I'll either find some workaround or I'll, I'll pester them enough to try to make it work. We would occasionally, like I had to get them to fix one thing in, the CD, in their CD code. Eventually, the way, that is where I, I was saying earlier where I had to make a smoking gun, but like I sort of also, I modified their code because I just hacked their code by just changing the byte codes and like got it to work like that. I'm like, you can do this. Look, I've fixed it. And that was gonna be my workaround. If, I, if they wouldn't fix it for me, I was just gonna like edit their code, like patch it basically, because it was in their operating system code to like work. These are not multitasking operating systems. There's basically no, almost no operating system on the PlayStation 1. So it's, it's got one CPU and it's running one thread all the time, which is almost a good thing when running a game. So when you call one of their functions, like they have this function to move the CCAD on the disk, well, it blocked. It waited for the head to finish moving before coming back to you. And there was no, what I wanted was a, like a two-step function, which was like, tell it the head to move this place, and then another one to check if it was done moving or to see where it was or anything where I could like check again later because I have to keep running the game. The game always has to run or it pauses, it freezes. You can't have a video game that, that's an action video game just go like, that's not a good experience. It's like, they'll think it's crashed. I mean, even if it's like for a third of a second. If you tried to move the head on the, on the disc and it would just, hang for a third of a second, some of the time, like a third of the time or something. 
and that's not acceptable. Like, in a good it means you can't run it in the background. What? I, now, I was willing to wait for the head to move. I knew the head had to actually, the head takes a third of a second to actually move. It's a physical thing. So, but I need the ability, and I knew the hardware could do it, like to tell it to move, and then later, when it had gotten where it was going, do something else. There's various ways to do that. You can either pull it to check it, or you can get an interrupt. The CPU is doing its, running its one program in linear order. It's do A, do B, do C, do D, and it just keeps doing that. But some things need to interrupt the system. Like, they might be things like, actually one of the earlier uses of interrupts was moving the mouse, like say on the Macintosh. Like, uh, on the 1984 Macintosh, like, it's the CPU that moves the actual cursor. It erases what's under the old cursor, and it draws a new cursor in. This happens, has to happen rapidly, so that the mouse moves rapidly, and the regular program is doing its own thing. So an interrupt, there's a hardware support for basically causing the interrupt to happen, the regular program is suspended, the special interrupt handler like runs, it does something very small, like move the cursor, which is actually not so small, but like, but in our ca in, in my case, like interrupt handlers that I had might be when the CD gets where it's going, it might just update a number that just says the CD has gotten where it's going, or the, the CD is now at this spot on the CD, so I know where it is. And then it goes back to the to, to its regular scheduled program. This is a way of introducing sort of allowing certain things to run at higher priority. Now, all computers since the early 70s have had some interrupt support. It's in a lot of ways how multitasking is built on computers these these days. But like, uh, and it, it was generally for interfacing with hardware stuff because a lot of hardware requires things be done very rapidly. Like some of these CD controllers, it might be that when it gets there, you must tell it to start reading right away. Otherwise, you'll have to spin the disk all the way around and you'll lose some time. So the interrupt handler would, it would do these kind of things. But he didn't have an interrupt handler on the CD seeking, but they needed one. Yeah. So I had this hacked version, which I used for a while, and then eventually I got them to add it after I convinced them why, that, that there was this problem and then why it was needed. Like, at first they're like, well, why do you need that? In their mind, the only thing you would do with the disc while you're playing a level was play music off it, which didn't require seeking. You just started playing the music and let it play. But I wanted to use the disc to load data in a sort of sophisticated way, which we have to change all the time. So if he runs forward, it loads one thing. He runs backwards, it loads another thing. You die, it loads a different thing. Uh, and that meant I needed to move the head to different places on the disc to get the different data. So in looking at the original PlayStation 1 design, while it was well designed and balanced, the machine had two megabytes of RAM and one megabyte of VRAM. And that was not an unreasonable amount given its price point and where, where it was at, but it wasn't that much. But it also had the CD drive, which was 640 megabytes of read-only storage. And that's a lot more. The ratio is very big. So I had the theory, going back to Way of the Warrior, when we, I'd done this on the 3DL, where it actually had some similar issues, uh, that it would be possible, not strictly necessary for every game, but it would be possible to make levels, I think video games are generally composed of levels, uh, until the 2000s when, in Jack and Daxter, we got rid of the whole level idea. But, the, but previous to this, almost all video games were made of levels. The idea was that the levels could be much bigger than two megabytes. Like nor in a normal game, you have a game like Twisted Metal or something. I'll just pick on Twisted Metal, which is an excellent game, like an early PlayStation game. You go to the Eiffel Tower level and it would load the Eiffel Tower level into say one megabyte. And then it would load all the cars in, and, it's, and it needed some extra space for working in the program or whatever into the other megabyte. So each level would get a budget of, let's just call it one megabyte. So they would have a certain amount of art in them and animation it was about one megabyte's worth. Now you could do various things to try to squeeze that down, but you were no getting around and maybe you could adjust the balance, you got 1.1 megabytes and you squeeze some of your other stuff. But there's no way getting around this basic thing and people didn't really try. So they just kind of squeezed. And so every game's levels were gonna look like roughly a megabyte, maybe a megabyte and a half of data. That was just sort of like a given. Now that was sufficient. The many, many PlayStation games were made with decent looking levels or whatever. But it was part of my theory that that didn't have to be so. 
that I could use advanced virtual memory techniques to swap chunks, in my case, 64K chunks of data in and out from the, like basically, so if the level was, let's call it 30 megabytes, and I have like one and some megabytes in the machine, well maybe you only need, at any one moment in time, one megabyte, but the level's actually 30 megabytes. Let's pretend this works. It, does, it did work, because Crash does it, but like, but there's a lot of challenges in this. Like, then all of a sudden, your levels are now 30 megabytes or 40 megabytes. So they look 30 times as lush as everyone else, and everyone else is like, like if you look at like Crash's textures versus say Tomb Raider's textures, Crash's textures are all pretty sharp with a lot of color and detail and Tomb Raiders are like all washed out and pixely and whatever because they only have so much memory. They can't, they don't have any place to put all that extra texture. We had 20, 30 times the amount of, uh, of space for it. Like there's tricks, I mean cost benefits on this and like there's complexities, a lot of complexities or the number of polygons in the level, something like Tomb Raider, it's pretty blocky, like square corridors and whatever, and Crash has like weird shapes and whatever because we have many more polygons. There were a bunch of different technologies that served this, but the memory was a huge one. This was one of my sort of like, patch, I have a whole bunch of patents in it uh, on this actually, like about the use of memory. And it comes directly out of thinking about different level tiers of memory. Computers have tons of tiers of memory. Like, I remember this specific computer architecture class I took at MIT, like, like, which basically the entire class is about tiers of memory and storage and like different things. And there's like sort of stand, and it's, it's oriented towards hardware designers. But So I understood how the hardware designers thought about it. But in a way, the, the CD is just a further storage. It's bigger, but it's slower. It's further away from being able to use it. But, but why can't you use it? It's there. Like, it's one of the advantages of the machine because if you have a typical game on an early PlayStation game and they have like one megabyte levels or two megabyte levels and the CD is 640, well, that means they could fit 300 levels on the, on the CD. Did they have 300 levels? No. That's, that would take them like 10 years to make the game. So the, the CD is just mostly empty or they fill it all with music because music is kind of fat or video or something. But you know, a lot of times it's just empty. Games like Twisted Metal might only be... 50 gig, I mean 50 megs on the disc. Like instead of being 600, Crash is almost full. So like why not use it, it's there. Like, I mean there's some features of the machine we don't use, but I try to figure out like different ones, like what could be, how can we turn that to our advantage? Here's how it basically works. So the computer, the CPU and the GPU can only really access stuff that's in the memory, right now. Like cause every 30th of a second in a video game is a right now. It's the render my frame. You have to keep doing that every 30 seconds or the game won't play properly <laughs> or at all. So anything that you're actually going to draw right now, any animation you're going to be using right now, any sound you're going to be playing right now has to be in memory because you can get to the memory quickly. There's a latency on the CD. So the CD takes about a third of a second to move its head to any specific spot on the CD. And then it might take... It takes some time, that was a double speed CD, to, to actually load the data. It could load a megabyte in maybe six seconds or something, six, eight seconds maximum. It's like a pipe that the data has to go through. So you can't just go draw one frame and go get a new different megabyte off the disk because it's gonna take you eight seconds minimum, theoretical, to get that different megabyte off the disk. Well, what are you going to do, just sit there, do nothing for eight seconds? You can do that between levels. So when a level switches, that's why a typical game would go to a loading screen and they'd load that whole megabyte or whatever off the disk. So my idea was that I would chunk the entire level into 64K chunks. Actually, there were chunks within the pages. So there were 64K pages, and then there were chunks of data. They could be something, anything from a crash animation, some crash code, a piece of background a sound, some texture. Chunks had to be less than 64K, and they had to go in pages like a jigs like you piled them in until the page was almost full, or all the way full. But they couldn't go across pages, or you'd have to break the chunks into smaller chunks. Then the level consisted of 30 megs of pages. There were like, whatever, one point something, I think there were you know, generally something like 16 or so pages, 16, 18 pages that could fit in memory. 
the problem is, can I arrange the chunks in the level such that at any one point in the level, I never need more than 16 pages worth of, of data? If you need more than 16 pages simultaneously, then you have a fault. Like, there's nowhere for it to go. But if you need less than 16, 16 or less, then they, then they can actually, like, fit. And you can actually take the same chunk, duplicate it into multiple pages, if that makes the whole puzzle work out better. Because it's not a, there's no real problem with extra space on disk. The game is constantly, it's, it's figured this out in advance, but it's constantly figuring out which pages it's going to load in if you're going this way, and which pages it's going to load in if you're going that way. And it throws away old pages that it doesn't need and loads new ones into their place. But it can put the pages on top of, they're like slots, it can put them in anywhere where any page can replace any other page, as long as you never need more than 16 active ones at once. The pre-occlusion system was extra data that we used to tell the game what to render so that it could render like three times as much because it already knew what to render. But in a normal game, they would have had no memory for this pre-occlusion data. It was very big. There was lots of, it was part of our 30 megabytes, but they only had one megabyte. So like in the 30 megabytes, it might be that like six megabytes that were pre-occlusion data. So the camera moves through the world and there's data for what you can see at each possible camera position. Well, you can't simultaneously be at the beginning of the level and the end of the level. You can only be in nearby levels. So you sort of group it together. The pre-occlusion data is like about equally dense everywhere in the level but it's kind of linear with the linearity of the level. If the level branches, then it branches off. It's like a stream, like in the same way you'd stream a YouTube video nowadays, where it's a multi-directional stream, because you stream forward and backwards, and you can branch and stuff, but it's a stream of data about what you can draw here and near here. So it wouldn't, using that data would not have been possible without the chunk system, but it isn't the chunk system. It's data within the chunk system. Well, the chunk system was actually the first thing I wrote in Crash Bandicoot. Literally the first thing I wrote. And I wrote it in Boston. Like, not all, I didn't finish it. But, like, I didn't even know what game we were making. It was, like, one of my big next things that I was working on, like, out of, like, informed by the lessons I learned on Way of the Warrior. And, like, using the CD there, I'm like, this is, this is going to work. Because the, the CD could do what I wanted in Way of the Warrior uh, on the 3DO. And I'm like, so if all CDs can do this, then this virtual memory chunk system is going to work. So I wrote this general framework for, like, ma for managing chunks and pages of data uh, on the SGI like, in Boston before we even knew what kind of game we were going to make. And like, so it was always a framework in Crash. Everything had to be fit into the chunk system. Like, there's several things that I've done in my programming career. Where I did the multiple times evolving. Uh, the chunk system is one of them. There was an earlier, much cruder, it wasn't really chunks, but like, sort of, like a variant in Way of the Warrior. And then Crash was, in some ways, its best expression. It went more advanced in Jack in some ways and backwards in some ways. Some of the limitations of the chunk system, like some of the other programmers complained about. And they're like, ah, like breaking everything up into 64K is just too annoying. Like, we shouldn't do that. And so they convinced me not to. And like, so I moved some things forward with the, in, in this evolution of, it was all about moving streaming data in for the game, like adaptively. So there's some, some really advanced new things that were going on in, in Jack, but then, and that enabled the multi, the seamless world loading. It would have been better in a chunk system, but it wasn't paged. It, there was the chunks, actually, but there was no, they had made me take away the pages and I regretted it the entire time. And if I was doing it again, I would like back to the chunks. I mean, back to the pages. I had a theory for the PlayStation 3, actually, which I, I didn't implement because I left at that time, how to use the actual virtual memory hardware on the, on the PS3 to just do it automatically, semi-automatically in a really cool way. Like getting access to the, to the, Verte the fixed point vertex units, like that was a sort of necessity and a sort of making proper use of what was there. Whereas like the, the sort of chunk system and that thing, that was like a sort of conceptual idea I had about CDs on video game machines in general. And the relationship, the realization the memory would always be too small or you could always use more, more memory was always better. Like it meant more game detail and you could use the CD like memory. People had it streamed, there were games that streamed kind of, but they were more video games. I mean, not, not video game, video games, but game, game, some of these early CD games like were like kind of like weird videos, like the you, like interactive videos, they were kind of lame. I was definitely one of the first people to see that you could 
really use that storage on the CD or the disk drive, it doesn't really matter, as like a dynamic part of your game to sort of expand. That's done all the time now. I wouldn't actually really categorize it as not enough hardware. It's maximize the hardware. Because we took for granted whatever they gave with it. It was kind of enough. But it's not like it was generous. It was like kind of livable. Like, but the more you could get, the better. That was a competitive advantage also. It was part of the Naughty Dog philosophy, given that the hardware on a console machine, like the PlayStation, was a particular fixed thing, to leave no stone unturned, no cycle of CPU you could, or GPU or byte of memory that you could use unused. So if it existed there in the machine, whether we were supposed to use it or not, whether you had to use some crazy trick to use it or not, whether it was helpful in one way or a different way, we would figure out how to like make the most of it. We were making this game for the PlayStation. Mm -hmm. And yes, we might at some point move it to some other machine or whatever, but a lot of, a lot of teams would make games for multiple machines and so then they write them for the least common denominator. Ours was like designed, it was for the the most <laughs> uncommon denominator, like to just maximize things out. If we had to figure out how to get the most out of some other machine at some later point, then so be it. So early in Crash's development, we totally knew we wanted to do this kind of animation, never really been seen in video games, like this sort of Looney Tune style, distorting animation, like the whole kind of thing where characters can sort of, you know, they can stick their their face, their eyes can, bul they see something, their eyes can bulge out and like, it's a very stretchy, rubbery style of animation, which is done in traditional cell animation. And it's highly evocative because it, it ties into human sort of archetypes of form and facial expression and exaggerates them in a sort of cartoon way. And it, it lets you know, you know, convey emotions and humor and stuff in ways that like more rigid or less animated things just can't possibly do. So we knew we wanted this. And there were various steps to, well, how do we get it? The first step was, is it even possible to get that kind of animation like on a Silicon Graphics workstation, like using the, you know, software like uh, the three big animation programs at the time were Power Animator, Wavefront and Soft Image. And Power Animator and Wavefront like merged, and that was the company we went with. We owned one license of Soft Image actually, but like Power Animator was basically the, the best one for the most part. <laughs> they had all trade-offs. And so Jason like made this crash model and he set about trying to do cool and wacky animations with him. And he found with some work that it was you could get the power animator to actually do it. Because it had these sophisticated like bone and vertice weighting tools and these distortion fields and like he couldn't do everything he wanted, but it but it also had things where you could take like the mesh of the character and break it up temporarily and use the like so if you wanted like the character to burn up and turn into dust or something, you, you had to do some of these things and they weren't really doable using the classic bone model, but he could get them to happen on Power Animator. And so initially, you know, I'm like using the sort of standard bone st strategy that in doing it on the PlayStation, I'm like, ah, we can't compute very many bones. And it's basically impossible to get vertices in the bone. So, so the seams are like, there's always cracking along the joints. It looks really, if you have a lot of joints like we did, he's cracking all over the place. And he looks all weird. And like, I know you can see this cracking in a lot of games, like, like Tomb Raider or whatever. But it just didn't look very good. Like, not we wanted it to look really smooth. And, and then with the bones, you just couldn't get this kind of de deformational thing. So Jason's like, well, it works on Power Animator. Get it in there. <laughs> I'm like, well, we can read the positions of all the vertices. If you know where the positions of all the vertices are in every frame, then it doesn't matter what kind of bones. The, the SGI can use a thousand bones and it's all the same. You're just drawing the, the, the polygons and their vertice positions. And it's, it can be done even quite fast. Like, you don't have to do any bone work. Like, so you don't have to, you have to spend any CPU on bones. But the problem with that strategy is then you have an animation where it's 30 frames a second and you got a lot, we want a lot of animation in our game. 
and you need to store, and Crash ha is like 600 polygons and maybe like 500 vertices or what, and you gotta store the position in every frame animation for every vertex. That's a lot of data. But at the same time, we also are already committed down this deadly choice of using this crazy memory strategy to 30-fold our data. So, well, we can handle a bit more data than other people can. I was thinking about this with Mark quite a bit. We're like, well, I, I did it and it worked. Like, because the, the PlayStation development unit had like eight or 32 megs of memory. Like, so you could have a much bigger thing than, uh, than would ever work on the real machine. Like, and so, so we would bake down the animation data use, you know, using all of Jason's fancy effects in Power Animator. And it was, it was just, it took up a ton of space in memory, just like time. But we had it in this development. It was never going to fit in the regular machine. So we're working with this for months. And always I'm thinking, we're going to have to fit it in there somehow. It's just so huge. It's going to have to get smaller. But I had this hunch that there really wasn't so much data in a mathematical sense, that we could write a domain-specific compressor, it's called for this. There ends up being a lot of domain-specific compressors in Crash. So what that means is data in a sort of computer science theory has a certain complexity, and the random, random data is the most complex. Truly random data is not compressible if you don't want to lose any information from it because you don't know where it's going. But other data is often, there's a pattern to it and limits to it. And with like the animation data, it can tolerate some data loss. The same theory is why JPEG works and why J JPEG totally changed the internet and totally changed how images are stored. And for the first 15 years of my computer career, didn't exist. Image files were big and they loaded slowly and you loaded a picture and went eh. And like you just couldn't put a lot of images on a disk drive, like or transfer them over the internet. And then for JPEG, you transform the image into frequency space, the difficult mathematical transform, and you throw away the high frequency junk, and you flip it back. And depending on how much junk you throw away, it looks better or worse. But it's still like the main, the most important parts of the image, like are are the low frequency parts, and they're retained. And it got like 1 20th or 30th the size because you took out the unimportant stuff. But it did get worse. JPEG, heavily JPEG images look considerably blurrier because they look lower frequency than the original image. So I was pretty convinced, uh, and so was Mark, that this animation data was like that. That you could take out the high frequency information and that you might have a particular vertex like, you know, like a vertex in its waist, it wouldn't move up and down that much. It might move left and right, but not up and down because it's always kind of as a waste. So every component of every vertex, X, Y, Z, is different. So Mark wrote this program where he analyzed, he took a bunch of the animations and it analyzed every component of every vertex and calculated kind of the dynamic range of the amount of change that occurred across animations and found that indeed most axes, the information change was quite low. Like, like they just didn't do much. So it turned out we could use this very specialized thing where it would analyze a particular animation and then it would figure out the range that all these things and it would have a map at the beginning that said the like vertex seven, Y only need, you know, low information. So it only needs two bits and it moves over this range. And this one needs this many bits. And the end was something like 50 or 80 to one compression. Like the data got like, you know, 50th the size by understanding what it was like very thoroughly and understanding like you can you could also change the there was like a dial on each animation like you would compress it and if it was too big you could turn up the dial and it would take some precision out of it and so the animation might get a tiny bit jittier more jittery but still basically look the same you turn the dial way up the animation would get all weird and like kind of strange but basically when we're working with the levels if some animation was kind of big in the level or was a problem you could just turn the dial up a little bit and hopefully squeeze it down. I remember it was a looming threat for a long time. We definitely solved it after the point where we 
had a playable thing. Like a lot of these threats, like at actually making like the chunk system work in real time on the disk, that was solved much later too. Like taking it under faith that I could solve that problem or that one of us could solve that problem, but like usually it came to me, but the Mark had graciously volunteered to solve this particular animation problem. So I'm like, have at it. I had this budget of like 30 megs. I said, well, you can't really make levels that are bigger than 30 megs right now, but I think I'll be able to squeeze <laughs> them into the into our one and some megs, like in in the end, like and it's a little more sophisticated than that. I, there was a little more wisdom, but it would, but I was like praying that it would work because the thirty megs was like also the uh, like that that actually worked on the the dev units or whatever. So we had various solutions to the gameplay in Ted Stage, but we knew we wanted really fast gameplay. And so we had this realization that basically we had added a dimension, you know, in going to 3D. So the simplest strategy, which worked on, on different level types, was take out a dimension, but take out different dimensions in, in some way. So an example of that was say like the boulder level like where the boulder's chasing you. Well, the dimension we're actually taking out there is time. It's not the one of the, the three spatial dimensions. By having the boulder chase you, it provides like an inherent intensity. Like there's still some spaciousness on the other things and you have to navigate through, through that. But because of the hurried nature of it, that the boulder's gonna smush you if you don't move like now, 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 you don't have the luxury to pick around those other dimensions. So it drives you through the otherwise sparser thing so fast that it feels just as intense. And the hog level is a reverse of this with the same kind of time thing. The hog keeps moving, but instead of the thing moving at you, you keep moving at the things. Like you're on the hog and you can't control how fast he goes. He's a wild hog. And he goes forward and you have to navigate kind of two and a half other dimensions, you know, or really mostly left and right, and you're jumping and other, and, or attacking. I think he, maybe he can only jump, I can't remember the original hog. But basically by being driven forward, the intensity is, is maintained through, through a different level. And then we had the more normal 3D level, like Insanity Beach, the first level of Crash Bandicoot is a perfect example of this. While in our initial designs in the failed levels, the level was wide open. And this gets right into some of the criticism that was leveled about Crash like versus Mario 64, which is there they said, oh, they're truly open world. Well, Mario is less intense. You can run away from things and run around them. And there's a lot of sort of exploring. Well, Crash isn't an exploring game. Crash is a intense action game. In something like Insanity Beach, we put walls of jungle up in order to sort of narrow that dimension down, not fully, but partially. And then there's other things to help narrow it down by, for example, the enemies, say like a crab or skunk in those levels, they track you laterally, fairly aggressively. So that you really, because basically the crabs are a little slower, you can run around them, but not, not much. But, this, but some other enemies track sideways fast enough that you can't really run around them, which sort of linearizes them with regard to that left rightness, like which is in some ways like the new dimension in that perspective, like compared to the traditional one. So that doesn't mean we can't use the new dimension when we want it to, because you can have a box on the left, a box on the right, and then you can make interesting, you know, interesting things where they have to choose to face this peril and go over to that box. Or if you're in like something like Hog Wild, we would deliberately do this. It might be that the spiky thing is over on the left with a box and the clear path is on the right. So the simple way to survive that obstacle is to go all the way over the right and just ride past the spiky thing. Then you leave the box unbroken. To get the box, you have to like go to the last minute right in front of the spiky thing and then slide over. So it gives you this choice, and that increases the density of so choice versus conflict in the game, which is fun. Like, because you can take the easy route out, or if you want to like be better and get whatever's in the box, like but you want what's in the box might be a free life or something, then you have to risk your life with the spiky log to get it. So we do these things constantly. We worked out how to do these things in each section or timing elements like on some of those 3D in out type levels, like the rollers, they go, like they help create like sort of reduced dimensionality in that point by creating like timing tension in there. And then you can time together 
things like you got these roller ones and then you have like a platform for it so you have to jump and then you have to you're on the platform you have to jump through the through the timed rollers but then you can add to the tension by making the platform like drop it's like a time platform you you get on it, it goes and then drops well that means like you can only stand on that platform for two seconds or whatever so you can't get on the platform and wait for these things to get in a good position you have to anticipate what position they're going to be in when you get on that platform plus two seconds or whatever you can pause briefly on it to adjust. All these things gave us tricks for increasing intensity. And then we had other format levels where we took away a dimension. For example, there's a bunch of levels that are kind of, like say the wall, great wall level, where you're bouncing on the boxes and climbing up and going left and right and, and stuff. There, it's essentially kind of 2D. I mean, you can come, come out, uh, but we've just, made a somewhat 2D level by fixing the camera looking to the side. So those were, that was the first one we got to work really well, like that, not that particular level, but like that style, by basically making it three, 2D within the 3D. And then there's another type of level where the camera's up like this and Crash moves in a sort of grid, but there's not too much play with the up and down and instead of being wide open, you're above something deadly on, on walkways, for example. Uh, I don't remember the names of the, the levels that were of this style, but like there were a bunch of ones at the end with robots that were like this, and there's some cavern ones where the, it's like a dark cavern, you fall to your death, and there's torches. And so we've removed a lot of the open space on purpose to subtract the vacuum. And then the up has a somewhat more limited role in that level, but it does sometimes you have to jump over some things within it. So we, in each of these cases, we're like adding constraints or removing areas of free, degrees of freedom to try to narrow it down and increase the intensity. But by not doing it, this, because we have this extra dimension, the game is more varied than a, than a traditional 2D one would be because we're removing different dimensions and different levels. We have like seven, 10 different strategies for removing dimensionality. Because if, the, if what the player can control is full three dimensions of movement and there's the aspect of time, and then you've got the obstacles and enemies within that, if they're too smart, but if you pull some aspect of that out. You limit their movement in one in one or another dimension. You increase the pacing of time or, or constrain one of them or move things faster or, or whatever. You can try to narrow it down to up the intensity back up and remove as much empty and dawdling space. Boxes too actually were designed to fill in the void. As we got into this in particular in our early sort of test levels, it turned out that like people weren't that great at judging like the sort of like the 3D distances involved in like how far do you have to jump or go from funny angles. And they were particularly really bad when the camera viewpoint was in the process of changing. In Crash where we control the camera, as a general rule of thumb, in a particular section or level or part of a level, when there's obstacles, we don't heavily move, like adjust the camera view, the sort of relative camera viewpoint. It's moving, but it, but it's sort of relative position and angle to crash will stay fairly similar for that stretch. And if it's gonna turn, which it does all the time, it will often turn in a quieter moment. Or if it's going to adjust and tilt down, because basically, if you're run, coming up on a pit and the camera is simultaneously raising, rotating, and tilting down, which might look good in a movie to create a sort of dynamic shot. And this is the kind of thing that in like, say like 1917, the camera is like orbiting on a drone or on some dolly or whatever, like all the time. It looks really cool in a movie. That does not play well in a video game because you've got your joystick and you've got your plus on the joystick, which has to map in some way into, you know, it's serving as your control for the character. If it's turning, like, which way are you going? Is it relative to the camera? Is it relative to the character? Like, and you have to sort of pick one of those. And if it's in motion constantly, like, then it's very difficult for them not to move weirdly and try not to mess with it too much, like, when the action was really intense. At MIT, before Crash and even before Way of the Warrior, my advisor was uh, a guy named Rod Brooks, who's a very famous roboticist. Like, it's one of the founders of the company that makes the Roomba. Rod and I, I, through extension, were big fans of like the Lisp programming language and this sort of philosophical idea with programming is of make your language suit the problem. That it's this, this is a sort of computer science-y way of thinking about like programs and programming is like 
it's problem solving and puzzle so solving and you're trying to express solutions to two different problems and the more your language fits that domain that you're operating in. Different programming problems have different domains. It could be like, if you're trying to like code audio manipulations like FM synthesis, that's a totally different day than writing video games. So Rod was very into this idea of domain specific programming. And he had written a number of his own languages for like controlling robots. So Lisp is an old, but really good, sophisticated, AI language that was designed for AI. It's, it's still in one of the ways one of the best. Like it's so it's not really supported. So it's like oh, the idea you could make a modern language, in it. It's got a very oddball syntax, which like a lot of programmers don't like. I happen to love, but like programs can operate on the programming, on the program, very easily. So it's metaprogrammable in this way that most other languages are not. And Rod and I both and many other guys and actually Paul Graham is a. Got, uh, a huge Lisp guy. He wrote several books on Lisp and is an advocate of this thing. And there was a book that I read by him called On Metaprogramming, or, so, I think it, or was it maybe there was On Lisp, and then there was the, which he also wrote. And I can't, but there was I can't remember the name. But there were these, some of these books were very influential in my sort of thinking. It's almost like philosophy of computer science in like metaprogramming, adapting your programs to write themselves, to like write more of themselves, and to express the ideas that you need to iterate on very rapidly and cleanly. And so something that had annoyed me tremendously in earlier video game pro program, like my earlier games, like before Way of the Were, was this problem how to write video game objects. Like things like, in Crash, it's like Crash himself. The skunks, the displays, like fruits, boxes, uh, you know, bouncy, you know, platforms. Like these things are all written with state machines, and regular programming languages historically made state machines incredibly. State machines are sort of formal computer science way of programming. Like it made it incredibly awkward. C language is terrible, just terrible at these. So it was just really difficult and annoying to write something like, you know, a platform that can like move here and wait and go through a sequence of things and like react arbitrarily when like like do something like bounce and crash jumps on it or whatever, like just like very awkward. So I was thinking about like in using the robot programming language at MIT before, I had been thinking about how this sort of approach could make like programming video game objects so much easier. So I wrote a simple version of this, like my first major iteration of this in Way of the Warrior and all of the characters in Way of the Warrior and their different moves and sequences, which are also state machine, typical video game things, are all written in this, this language. Uh, it had some name, but I can't even remember it at this point. It had worked really nicely, from my opinion, from my point of view. And so I'm like, right, we'll do all of them in Crash. Like, cause, like Crash is a character game, going to be a character game. You have tons and tons of creatures and objects. It also tied into the memory thing too, because normal program, like C code, is like typically once like the whole like Sony system was designed to have the whole C program load at once. So if you had a game with lots of levels with lots of different objects on the levels, and you've got like the skunks on one level and the crabs on another level, then you had to have like the code for the skunks and the crabs. Like if you're writing them in C in every level, they're just wasting memory, and memory was so precious. Like, if I write my own language, then I can kind of control where it goes in memory too, and I can like put the skunks just in skunk level, and that was another advantage of it. And so I designed this quite sophisticated like state machine language for like writing game object. And, I ha and it also, because it was like, it was interpreted, so it was a list language, and I had a compiler which compiled like these language files that described an object, like crash, or, or the boxes or whatever, into a pseudocode. And there was an interpreter in the game that's which ran the pseudocode. It was really compact. And it was also, you could reload it on the fly. So you could edit the box file, recompile it, and reload it without rebooting the game, which was super, super useful because a lot of time is wasted in video game debugging and iteration. You gotta boot the game, you gotta wait for it to boot, you gotta, wait, you gotta wait for it to compile, you gotta wait for it to link, you gotta, then you have to fly through the, you have to go into your level, you gotta fly through the level of the spot you want, or run through the level of the spot you want, to get to the, ob the creature and get the scenario set up. If you can just reset it right there without having to go with it anywhere, and then try it again, change it, try it again, you save like, sometimes like five minutes per iteration, and the iteration becomes seconds. And there's some design rubric about like, 
every good design has, it requires a certain number of iterations. So speeding iteration loop up like allows you to test stuff out like more, ra more and more rapidly. And all the crash games used this, this language. And I thought it worked very well. It had its pluses and minuses. And I took all the minuses and, and I saw that it could do even more. And it went really crazy on Jack and Daxter with Goal, where the entire game was written in my own custom language. And then couldn't you, I had to write a compiler because it had to be fast too. But that's a different story or a different time. Keeping with the theme of kind of using what you have and everything that's available, like uh, as we were designing Crash on these new platforms, like uh, given that it's sort of committed to this crazy sort of chunk virtual memory system and sort of increase the possibility of like how much data we could have in our level, and also given that we had committed to using these expensive, super high power, like Silicon Graphics workstations in the office to actually make the game. We tried to find ways that we could exploit these, this synergy to like really like improve the game uh, like in a sort of technological ways. And one of these major ones that was sort of inspired by Doom in, so, uh, in some ways in this sort of whole way of thinking, which had been that in Doom, Carmack used pre-compute to analyze the sort of strange room layouts of the Doom levels and create a sort of binary space partition tree that kind of told him from within which room, like, what could be seen. It's a form of sort of pre-computed occlusion. So because it has to do with, like, the sort of realities of 3D graphics geometry, which is that, like, a small percentage of what is in the actual level data actually needs to be displayed at any one time. Like, for example, if you're in a room and the doors are closed, the room beyond that does not actually need to be rendered. But most naive rendering systems would actually draw it anyway, and then it would just be hidden by the doors. Well, that's pointless because you might spend a third of your rendering time drawing what's behind the doors. But actually figuring all that out is kind of complicated. And we, uh, we sort of extended, so, so he had done it in Doom with, in this sort of bulk way where individual rooms or zones like kind of knew what they could see and then the world was mostly constructed of rooms. And rooms cut off occlusion fairly sharply like because they have doors or corridors and twists and then they block. So you can only see like a room or two rooms at, at any one time. So we sort of extended this in our own minds. Well, anything can occlude. A twist in, a, in the jungle and a canopy, thick canopy of trees, or even the ground, it turns out, is a very large percentage of the polygons. Like you got a rolling ground and it's like a big mesh of, of polygons. But then if you lay something across the ground, like a log or a stone, in the sort of tilt back of the sort of slope, that horizontal stone blocks a huge percentage of the ground beyond it. You know this if you walked up to a giant like redwood tree lying across the thing, you can't see the ground behind the redwood tree. You only see the ground leading up to it. But the gamer doesn't actually really need to see the ground behind the redwood tree like until they get up on the tree. So we had this theory that you could, that it would be possible to construct the world in such a way that it looked more organic and mixed up and it had all these f occluding features, pillars and things lying down. If you think now to Crash Bandicoot and the paths always have things that have fallen across them and logs you've hopped up and pits that block. And there's a lot of this stuff in Crash and that's for a reason because we had this idea that we could use the SGIs to take every place the camera could be and compute exactly what could be seen from that point of view. And then we would know from that place the list of exactly the stuff we'd have to see. We'd only have to store in memory that which could be seen and only have the engine draw that which could be seen. However, computing this and, like, and also storing this data set was you know, easier said than done. Uh, but it also had the hunch that this data didn't change that rapidly so that as you move through the world, like the list of what you'd be seeing was kind of permuting slowly. And any data set that permutes slowly is susceptible to compression, to particularly custom compression, because there's really not as much data in there as you think. There's the old data and there's new data. This is how like YouTube or any video streaming service like compresses its videos, because even though if the raw data from video is tremendous, particularly high, you know, some kind of 4K high resolution raw data, just hugely tremendous, but from frame to frame, not that much changes. I'm sitting here and the background is staying the same and only parts of me are moving and whatever. If you can figure out and 
represent just the parts that change and create an algorithm to do that, then you can represent the data in a fraction of the space. Occlusion is like the, the knowledge that some sort of shapes or objects in the game world or really in this case, uh, case like polygons actually can block the visibility of anything that's behind them. So if something is totally blocked by something in front of it, you don't actually need to draw it. In Crash Bandicoot, because we knew that the engine was, was processing full, uh, detailed occlusion like on everything in the world, we constructed the world systematically to occlude itself. So various fronds, plants, logs, pillars, rocks are always kind of twisting and coming across your view in order to sort of occlude or hide maximal chunks of the background so that they don't actually have to be rendered. Now, kind of every detail in Crash Bandicoot was thought about, and for example, this being the first level, as you open up, you're introduced to Crash, and he gets up, and he looks right at the, the player to try to sort of, like, engage them before you get to see his back, as we were worried about in our initial thoughts. And then you're exposed to this sort of pretty place. You might not have even seen it in video games at that point in time where there's, like, you know, lush desert and jungle, and there's not a ton of hostility hostile action here. Here's one of those things that occlude, that cut off the trail, an obstacle in the form of pit. There's not actually that many enemies on screen because we couldn't support that many, but we filled in the empty spaces to a large extent with, with boxes because it turned out that like boxes were, well, they're low polygon and they're very versatile and they're kind of a lot of fun to like bust up and mess with and they can affect gameplay in various ways. So uh, back in January of 1996, like the game was like shaping up, and we were heading into E3, and there was still a lot of sparseness to the game. Like we just couldn't put that many of our detailed enemies on screen at, at one time, and that many pits or obstacles. It was just too hard then, and there was a lot of empty space, and we just had a bunch of fruit about. And so we were discussing this problem, and Jason's like, we need more enemies. And I'm like, well, we don't have the polygons for more enemies. You've used all the polygons in Crash. You stole them all. And he's like, well, what's low polygon? I'm like, yeah, we can have some triangles. That's the lowest polygon you can get. What about boxes? And I'm like, well, yeah, there's only six polygons per box. I guess maybe we could have boxes. And we started thinking about that. We realized that you could do a lot of things with with crates, they can have different things in them, witch doctors like I just had here, extra lives, and then they could stack and interact with each other. And like there's one coming up here where, oops, I missed one. So over here, there's um, some white ones that are like ghostly, and then they can drop down in the stacks and create puzzles out of them. So they had, for what's a simple object, you know, a few polygons and a few rules, they're incredibly versatile. And so we, after we talked about them, we got back to the office and like just started whipping up some textures and I started programming. Oh, there's the switch. And see, so you can like make that thing, that bridge appear, but then you want to get all the boxes and you have to do this very dicey, I'm not going to even try, like where you bounce carefully and get all of them. You know, by the end of that day, we pretty much had all the basic box types that are in this version of Crash Bandicoot done and we added more types as the sequels went through. Uh, these original I probably played with my son maybe five years ago or something. And we had a great time playing it together. It was a little, he was maybe five or six then. He was a little too young to really do it well. Now he can, he's 11, he, now he can play it easily enough. But Crash 1 is still a fairly hard game, particularly because of its sort of tough save system, which was sort of both an accident and, well, a learning lesson. But we were required to support like passwords. Like Sony didn't want to require people to to have the memory cards at the beginning. And it's just, already this is a kind of a complicated game to, uh, to save like on a password. There's just not enough bits in the thing. It still holds up great, it's still fun. Like, it looks good. Yes, it's not the highest res, but the controls are still really good. And this is Crash 1. The controls got a lot better with Crash 2 because it, the, we got the analog stick. And the camera is kind of rigid in Crash 1 too, but like it's still, I think it looks and feels great. It has, still has all its intensity. You can see the timing, the timing traps. You got that guy, and then right behind here, you got Maurice, the plant. Oops, who got me? Yeah, so we had interesting mixed reception. So most people were super blown away and, and positive. Diehard, like, Nintendo fans felt personally affronted in an interesting way, because it was in direct competition with Mario 64, which at the time was synonymous with the PlayStation. So we get this funny kind of like, 
bashing about how it wasn't, like, everything that wasn't in Mario 64 wasn't in this. But they're just very different games, even though they're in the same genre. Like, with really different emphases. Crash is much more intense, and it's, you don't have to do as much thinking, and Mario's really a puzzle game and an exploratory game. Like, and this is not an exploratory game. It's got a sort of wondrous world, but you just experience it as you go through. It's a kind of actually intense action game. For the most part, and certainly from PlayStation fans, who once it's sort of polarized and people enter their political schools of consuldom, <laughs> like, it was generally quite, uh, quite popular. And you guys knew that Nintendo was making Mario 3 We assumed they were, and we, but we didn't see it till about six months before it came out and Crash shipped. And we didn't play it until Crash was in beta. So it basically had no bearing on the development of Crash other than as a sort of general pressure that we knew that like this other mascot game was coming out. But fortunately, we also knew that it was only going to be on the Nintendo, so we didn't have to worry about it as a on the same machine sales. Oops. Was it, was it a race to see who would get first? Uh, not exactly because we, well, first of all, the Nintendo 64 was out much later, but we did, had no idea when it was really going to come out until E3. And they actually ended up beating us slightly, but not by much. And we were sort of doing the game as fast as we could, but it was already like all kind of set in stone with Crash's development by the, the time we saw Mario at all. You know, we assume that other people were working on this sort of general goal of 3D character action platform games as well, but we knew of none when we started development. And one or two sort of uh, mediocre ones came out like while we were under development. Mario was the only sort of serious competitor, and that came out like a month before we did. There's room enough in the space, and they were on different machines. At that time, it was less common for people to have both machines unless they were a very serious game player. I think actually the relative price, despite game machines, you know, being really expe uh, relatively expensive, but I think the relative price has come down because like the Atari 2600, I think, was $300. And that was like 1978 or whatever it was, you know. This was always a frustrating little point for, it's much easier actually in my original here than, because notice this, you can like, if I'm not holding the button, he jumps up to the bottom of that first apple. If I hold down the jump button, he jumps up to that third apple. So there's quite a bit of, and you can get in between, there's quite a bit of English on Crash so much easier in the original. It's ironic because they you know, they tried to make it easier, but they just, uh, there's a little bit of control mess up. The Crash was designed for this English, like you can go, uh, like you can reverse something out, like I can jump and then kind of come back a bit. Like he responds in the air, like or if I jump straight up and then move over, jump straight up and move over, he moves in the air, not as fast obviously as on the ground, or the, you know, the height of the jump, and you can combine all those things to sort of like get him where you want to be. Because ultimately in any kind of action video game, the controller is the translator between the intent of the player and the character. But you want that translation to be as seamless as possible. You want them to sort of be Crash Bandicoot in this context, like to, for him for him to do exactly what they want. Anytime he doesn't do what they want, then it's frustrating and the player gets angry. Like, so the art of good control is in making that translation as seamless as possible. This level, we were experimenting with everything we could think of for like how to, what different sort of points of view. And here we're like, well, what happens if we turn the camera around? Cause then we can see Crash's face and that's all cool and like, and whatever, but like you can't see where you're going. Didn't turn out to be that much fun. You ended up just kind of picking your way slowly. We do pull the camera out. Notice the arrow in, of fruit indicates which way you go. Yeah, it's nice and easy. You got this warm up and then you're in here and dun dun, just like in Raiders of the Lost Ark. It comes down. Now, you're running frantically. The sparseness isn't a big problem. It's still dangerous, even with the, spar uh, with the sparseness. Notice I died quickly. Because the challenge is in just surviving what's really a very easy traversal, uh, like putting in that first one without getting smushed by the boulder, and it's like not so easy. And then we slowly notch it up, and this is classic design. Like the first one just had a couple pits. This has a couple more pits. Oh, there's these things that slow you down. You gotta jump over them. They're like, and you keep adding element, ah, and it got me. So because of the unusualness of this perspective, and I think also because you get to see crashes like face, I don't remember if it's this one or maybe crash two, where when the boulder gets close, he actually like, like looks over nervously helps sort of bond you with Crash. You know, it's kind of funny to 
to think of that. But just like the way you, if you're writing a movie or a novel or something, you want to endear the, uh, the characters to, to the reader, you have the same thing like with the video game, like the, you want to bond the player with the, with the character. And all the while continue, oh, and there's a different kind of slowing you down thing. With the, you got to spin through those guys and into your, there's the little, oh, it didn't stop, I forget that one. So there's a longer stage here. Oop, I made it, but barely. It's actually, this is a little too hard. It's a little easy to fall off this pit right before the, the thing. Hogwai will likely see me die. <laughs> see in there, th that's a little signature crash move. But this again is l like the boulder level, like changes the dynamics of your relationship to the spatiality of stuff by moving you at a forced rate through it. Like, but it's a different change because you don't control it at all here and there's no inherent obstacle chasing you, but you have only a completely finite amount of time to negotiate the, the space between obstacles. There's forced forward games. I'm like endless runners nowadays are like really common forced forward. It's a common sort of gameplay strategy. Like, and that's, I'm sure been around since way before. We were maybe probably the first people to do it in a platform action game in 3D but I'm sure it had been in many games. You gotta wonder whether these native Crash Islandians would be PC in this day and age. No natives were exploited in the making of this game, nor any hogs. And he's running, you know, this hog is running through the hogs on the spit, kind of, oh, almost made it. <laughs> Just kind of disturbing. <laughs> the, the whole save system in here, because of the passwords, was like really weird, where you have to like get the ton the ton of heads and then solve the puzzle, and so it can be a bit frustrating because like it requires some fairly difficult things just to save your progress at all, and then it won't matter here. But like now we have to go back to the very beginning of the hog level. Crash Bandicoot was really the crucible in which the Naughty Dog philosophy was forged, and a key component of that. Crucible is fire on all cylinders, like that every element that goes into the game needs to be great because we wanted to make a truly great game, a game that was gonna be a hit, a classic. And in order to do that, we, we came to believe that everything in it had to be great. You had to start with fabulous gameplay. You know, there's many different gameplays, but it, like our gameplay was intense platform action gameplay. But you had to have that in like every piece of gameplay and it had to be pretty good. You had to have great controls. It had to look fabulous, be consistent. It had to sound fabulous. Then you needed the, the best technolo technology possible to make all that happen. The better your technology, the better the game could feel, the better it could look. And if you got enough of these things all right, you could sort of transcend mediocrity to become like a, a gaming masterpiece. And I see this in other games that are, you know, much, much newer games or like, and I will often say this if I, if I review them or coming to that they're, that the sum of their parts, like they've got so much greatness in them comes to transcend all that and make them a masterpiece. A great example of that is like Witcher 3, which is my favorite single player role playing game. And I've played like every role playing game. So <laughs> it's clunky in some ways, but Boy, is there so much great stuff in there that it just totally transcends all its clunk to, to be an utter masterpiece of the genre. Even in a business perspective, this has to do with the way in which game sales scale very well because the great games sell far, far more than the middling games because the game is made once, but then an additional copies are all extra revenue. It's your, you're just best served, at least in our philosophy, in just like making like a really fantastic product. It's not that there aren't other people making fantastic, fantastic products, but like, you know, some games are better than others. And then every year there's a bunch of really good ones. And usually the really good ones come from like the same teams. Crash Bandicoot started off selling well, but it just kept on going and going and going. Crash Bandicoot, the first one, sold better in its second year, maybe in its third year. And I'm pretty sure that like, when we shipped CTR in the Christmas week of CTR, Crash Bandicoot 1 sold more copies in that week than it had ever sold previously. And the games just, they resonated with the audience like at a bunch of different levels. Like, first of all, it was a really broad appeal game. Like everyone could kind of play it, whether you were a young kid or you were a hardcore gamer because the gameplay was good enough. 
like, even if it was a little silly, you know, uh, like it worked with all genders, ages, it worked internationally really well. You know, some hardcore gamers would be like, ah, it's a kid's game or whatever. But it was just a very broad appeal game because it wasn't highly violent, but the characters were appealing, it was funny, and the gameplay was like pretty intense and approachable. So you could just sit down and play it. And this is one of the things that we really wanted for it. I wanted a game that you didn't have to think too hard about. Partially like because my job in making games like Crash Bandicoot was always to think a lot and was very intense. I always liked games where you really don't have to think that much about it. Like now I often enjoy more cerebral games, but then like a game where you just like ran for it, like Crash, is really fun. It's, for, it's kind of soothing. It gets your heart rate up and stuff, but uh, you just sort of go into that kind of intense little place and like try to get through the level. So there's this really intense element of iteration, like you, know, you try it, you figure out what's working, like if it's not working, you do it again, learn your lessons, do it again, you do that between games in the series, you do that within the individual game because it has to get good enough on the first one, particularly that it's like still gonna be a great game. And instead of quality first and user first, I often say like, you know, people say about real estate, location, 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 but video games, it's gameplay, gameplay, gameplay. A lot of people lose sight of this and they're distracted by the theme of the game or how good it looks and whatever. And those are very important. That's part of finding your own skill and facilities. But if your core gameplay isn't fun, it's not a good video game. Like, because that's the most important thing to the genre, just as like in a film, like script is the most important thing. Other things matter tremendously in a film too, but if you have a crappy script, you're highly unlikely to have a great film. It's just bones aren't there. If you don't have great gameplay mechanics in a video game, it isn't fun to play, like fundamentally, then you're not gonna have a great video game. And we learned this in Crash 1 where we started with really great ideas and our initial attempts on them, unseen by the public, fortunately, uh, were not all that fun or they looked cool but were flawed or, or whatever. And we kept like working on it and trying to figure it out until particularly we got levels that were really fun to play. And we figured out for our particular game, and each game has its own sort of formula, and later you can play with the formula even within a game, like the Crash Bandicoot formula was how to create this sort of intense rhythmic gameplay within particular levels, and we have several different strategies that you can see in like every type of Crash level. I mean, not every level is completely different. There's ones that are like, you know, for example, there's two levels where you're, you're in a sort of snowy bridge, and the bridge drops, parts of the bridge drop. So those use the same basic techniques, even though one is harder than the other, the second one, the high road. And you have to develop these sort of like formulas for fun and sort of like play them out. And then they have to like fit into the overall like picture and vision of the game, something that was also formulated for, for us in here where we we did more design up front, but the right design, not a ton of gameplay design, like because you don't really know what that's gonna be like until you can find until you find the fun. But we did all this art design and character design so that we had a consistent world to work from and draw from. And all the way through all the Crash games we're working on, we could say of a particular idea, does that belong in Crash or not? And sometimes when I look at the sequels that that companies other than Naughty Dog did, there are a lot of stuff in there that does that in the mind of Jason and I, for example, does not belong in Crash. It's like outside of the core Crash idea for, for one reason or another. It's too goofy, too postmodern, referential to the, to the real world. Crash is slightly postmodern, but deliberately only slightly. He's not referencing current politics or anything. You can adapt almost anything into the Crash world, but it has to fit the flavor where it's like, it's not really mean. It's like, it's kind of a little goofy, you know, it's always got an element of humor, visual humor, like in the composition of the shapes of like characters, the way they're animated, like even in their names, like, you know, that it's N Sanity Beach or Dr. Neocortex. That's part of Crash's world, that particular stylistic humor, just as much as the, the colorful backgrounds and the stretchy animation are. I think one of the core legacies of Crash Bandicoot is that games can have their own distinct 
stylistic personality and art style. And yes, to some extent, many did before. I mean, Mario has its own sort of Mario style, but it's very much an old timey video game style. In some ways, it's like a random collection of sort of, of weird elements and it was very pixelated to begin with and they've updated that. But Crash had its own consistent world, which draws obviously from American cartoon style. And so, but the entire Crash product by that I mean our first four games, are consistent within that style. It looks, sounds, and, and animates, and, and plays in this way. And I think it's one of the reasons why Crash holds up very well. Like, you play, you know, the gameplay is still good, the, uh, the controls are still good and stuff. The originals still play quite well, and they still look pretty good, even like on a PlayStation 1, because the style sort of transcends the specifics of the pixels, and it, it doesn't look too old-timey, video gamey, and things aren't so random in there. Yes, there's a lot of silly stuff in Crash, but like, but it does that silly stuff belongs in his weird cartoon Pacific Island homeland. So when Crash 3 wrapped in for Christmas of 1998, I and a very small little core team rolled over onto the Jack and Daxter technology team, which actually named Next at that time. And then the game shipped in 2001. So Jack and Daxter was basically three years, but it was a sort of technology team for about the, the first year. That, like Crash Bandicoot 1, was a very big endeavor where we were going into new territory, all new engine, all new machine. The PlayStation 2 was a fabulous machine, but ludicrously complicated. Probably the most complicated game machine like ever. I don't know, it was a very complicated design with a lot of power and you know, really, am, really ambitious game. So it was a pretty long project. CTR also started during Crash 3. They were sort of, we got into this rhythm with Naughty Dog where we had a tech team that would like do work for six to 12 months during the heavy production period of the previous game. And then all the artists and designers would roll over en masse after the previous game was finished to the tech team. And then maybe a little bit after that, a new tech team would start up with the next game. So Crash Bandicoot shipped in September of 1996, and pretty much the moment we wrapped the, the American edition, the team, including myself, flew off to New York for the PlayStation one year anniversary party and the Crash Bandicoot launch party, and for some press tour thing, and that actually snowballed into, into heading off to Europe for EC, ECTS, and there was this kind of frenzied, like working vacation, which was huge fun because like having spent the last two years like in the office every single day, seven days a week, not sleeping and running around like big, you know, big cities like talking about the game was at least a, a welcome change of pace. Underlying this was a continual sort of stressful both how well the game do and there were like rumors percolating in of like, you know, a big bug or two or something, which turned out to be nothing, but like was causing me like serious stomach upset at the at the trouble because like with these CD games where you you know millions of copies are printed like on CD like a a bug that might cause recall could be like disastrously expensive and so it's very stressful. Nowadays you can patch a game and so it's got a slightly different economics that has its own stresses. But in those days like if you actually had a recall disc, which we never actually had to do, <laughs> but that that would be a big deal. And then simultaneously, there was this shadow through all that very brief little vacation time of the fact that the European and Japanese editions, which were a tremendous amount of, of customization work, pretty much all that was on my plate alone, were like right around the corner. And we needed to get the team rolling on to Crash 2. And they couldn't really do that without my help either. So almost no downtime, like, because as soon as it's back, I was frantically localizing those other two editions, like, popping back and forth to Europe and Japan to, to help with that, and trying to get, like, crazy new tech for Crash 2 going. So it was a pretty stressful fall. And then I mean, during our Christmas break that fall, the, the server hard drive caught on fire and burned, and we had to restore, like, completely from backup. That nearly killed me, but... Fortunately, we got it all back. Work at Arctic never stopped. In fact, in Crash 2, during 1997, I was in the office every single day from January 1st to September 9th, seven days a week, you know, generally from about like 10 a.m. to 4.30 in the morning. Like, it was just relentless. That entire year, like, in that stretch of time, I literally didn't go into a store. Not a grocery store, not a coffee shop. If I needed something at, at home, like, someone, like, bought it for me because they're like, oh, you can't leave the office.